King Kill 33, by James Shelby Downard with Michael Hoffman II. Preface to King Kill 33, James Shelby Downard's Vision. This excerpt from the essay King Kill 33 has been out of print since 1987, and the publication of the first edition of Adam Parfrey's Conspiracy Anthology, Apocalypse Culture. Subsequent editions of Apocalypse Culture, including the current Feral House edition, do not carry it. The late James Shelby Downard's primal way of looking at things, which is the way I think ancient man perceived the world, encompasses a vision that detects every link and every symbol, beginning with the significance of names, then places and then the obsessive actions which stem from the confluence of the two and which have come to be known as ritual. Publisher Adam Parfrey, who first brought Shelby's work to a mass audience, states, quote, In Downard's writings, the products of his subconscious bubble to the surface and catalyze painstaking research. The collision of the poetic against the logical works especially well in the field of conspiracy, it remains the freshest approach to a field of inquiry. End quote. I remember sitting in Shelby's Airstream trailer in St. Petersburg, Florida in 1977, along with the great Fortean philosopher William N. Brimstead and Charles Saunders, a brilliant recluse who was a close friend of Jack Kerouac toward the end of the beat writer's life, a fact missed by every one of Kerouac's numerous biographers, so much for biographers. Shelby's conversation that day ranged from the occult significance of the theremin musical instrument to the sorcerous implications of elevators, the relationship he had with an evanescent rabbit named Petey, the sinister connotations of the circus and the mystical topography of the American Southwest, which Mr. Downard knew the way you and I know our backyard. As he fried our hamburgers, he regaled us in his prospector's drawl with the hidden wonders of a tapestry of coincidences which he wove from the seeming mundane details of everyday living, into a magic carpet of incomparable strangeness, and peerless utility. Parfrey spoke for many of Shelby's friends and associates when he stated, quote, Downard has influenced me to look with interest upon the details and the fantastic convergences of life. End quote. For my money, James Shelby Downard is the one man most intimately tied to the once and future November, on the Camelot calendar's 33rd turning of the wheel, in this age of the revelation of the method, the era of the deluge of hidden facts made public, which Downard predicted would not liberate us, but only enslave us further. More than two decades ago he foresaw the coming of this time as the fulfillment of the final dictum of the alchemical rampage of the elephant must be, the behemoth run amok in the fields of our nightmares. As the X-Files and the other fictional TV shows which neither I or Shelby have ever seen, purposefully muddy the waters with a flood of pop drivel disguised as revelation, the actual truths are lost in the swirl. James Shelby Downard looked forward to the time beyond must be, to the era which will witness the return of could be. After the coming cataclysmic chastisement has run its cleansing course, we will once again wish upon a star and dream a destiny free of the Masonic chain that at present binds our nation as tightly as the hangman's rope once bound the rotted cadavers on Tyburn Tree. Despite having been relentlessly targeted and attacked for more than a half century, Mr. Downard, unlike poor Kennedy, did trip the Haradim on the winding stairs and did slide down the railing, like a child outwitting enormously big and powerful bad guys, by the fortune which Providence reserves for the guileless. Signed, Michael A. Hoffman II. Introduction? The power of the secret government over the news media continues unabated. During the time of the Watergate scandal, major scandals of the past were reviewed, but the torture and murder of Captain William Morgan in 1826, from which developed an anti-Mason political party which challenged Freemason Andrew Jackson for the presidency, General Jackson was involved with the Bell Witch, and the murder of Joseph Smith the Mormon prophet, which resulted in the men of the Mormon church withdrawing from Freemasonry, were major scandals that were ignored. The Kennedy assassination has to do with Masonic sorcery and the information I present in these pages is well known to certain news agencies who have chosen to suppress it, just as the motivation for the assassination has been plunged into cryonic secrecy, for facts concerning the assassination are supposed to be revealed in the future, which is a matter of public knowledge. That freeze, wait, revive plan is part of the master plan of Masonic sorcery. The ability of the secret government to immobilize the release of vital information to the public is in part due to the apathy of American people who have been benumbed by revelation after revelation. It is a peculiar phenomena that certain revelations move people to action while episodic revelations of the same type stun them into inaction. I have devoted years to trying to draw attention to Masonic sorcery and its relationship to political control. I believe that many people instinctually realize the power that Freemasonry exerts on the government of the United States, but since they have been hoodwinked they do not realize what the secrecy, silence and darkness that surrounds the mysteries of the Masonic art amounts to and what Masonry really is. So control of the government of the United States is just traced to Wall Street, and not to the crossroads of witchcraft. An archetype of betrayal of the common man i.e. 
The vulgar herd has been and is going on and the betrayal which involves a great deal of fertility and death symbolism is seemingly motivated by the endeavor to bring about syncretism in opposing principles of a mystic power, and to green Israel, rebuild the Temple of Solomon, and establish a one-world government. It is by way of Masonic sorcery that the union of opposing principles is supposed to be brought about and the people that practice Masonic sorcery are arch-criminals who have been and are perpetrating a crime against humanity. The arch-criminals staged managed Dallas in the killing of Kennedy, and the news media reaction ever since. There are today thousands or perhaps millions who are apathetic to the control that exists over us, and who labor under the misapprehension that somehow life can be beautiful if we only forget and discard our ideals while getting on to the business of consumption. America is a news ghetto where the news media continually endeavors to promote apathy while going through the motions, the lip-sync, of reform. Like a haunted house draining its occupants of will in return for sleep without nightmares, American people are mental captives of a horror that feeds them misinformation as its stone bell tolls the death of individuality. There is no happy last-minute rescue awaiting just around tomorrow because Americans do not have the truth about things around which to rally, and most just want money which would enable them to get the things that they have been told that they should and must have. I published this, in the wake of the situation Charles Seymour alluded to, the moralist unquestionably secures wide support, but he also wearies his audience. Well many Americans have gone beyond being tired for they have been so benumbed by the revelations that they are apathetic. In other words they just don't give a damn. Some however try to justify their lack of feeling about the revelations and I have heard some say, as though they were puzzled by a difficult question, why should I let such things upset me? Well to those people who are not completely lost in apathy and to those who are not apathetic yet, I say my condemnation of the Masonic evil is not moralizing and if they find out about the things that have been done to bring about the union in opposing principles of a mystic power and discover what the master plan has planned for them, they will not surrender to apathy and will get fighting mad. I will now make this a matter of record, most Freemasons apparently have no idea of the evil that is part of Masonry and if they do know about it they don't believe it, nor do most members of the clandestine lodges and Masonic oriented fraternal organizations. The same thing holds true for androgynous Masonic societies and the secret societies of women that are Masonry oriented, for Masonry is a secret anomalous thing. In other words most Freemasons are apparently unaware of the Masonic cryptocracy in the United States, and that also holds true for the aforementioned Masonic-oriented societies. Overview. Quote. It is certain that onomatology, or the science of names, forms a very interesting part of the investigations of the higher Masonry, and it is only in this way that any connection can be created between the two sciences. End quote. From the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Quote. When the ancients saw a scapegoat, they could at least recognize him for what he was, a pharmacos, a human sacrifice. When modern man sees one, he does not, or refuses to, recognize him for what he is, instead he looks for supposedly scientific explanations, to explain away the obvious. End quote. From Ceremonial Chemistry, by Thomas Sass. The science of names forms only one segment of the science of symbolism used by Masons. Names, that is to say, words in themselves are merely descriptions and they rise and fall in usage like a Cartesian doll with some words becoming archaic very quickly. What's more some words are given meanings that are known only to the initiated while other words are profound and abstruse so the science of names gets real weird even before it is identifiable as word wizardry by beginning investigators of it. The JFK assassination encounters this science in a decisive way and contains a veritable nightmare of symbol complexes having to do with violence, perversion, conspiracy, death and degradation. These elements are important not only as cause and effect in the murder of a president but in the ensuing reaction of the people of America and the world. The fertility and death symbolism in the killing of the King Wright which is part of greening ritualism that has to do with JFK has been suppressed because examination of it must necessarily link it to Freemasonry, and its mysticism as well as to the political influence it exerts. Obviously this would do some damage to public confidence in 1. Masonic progressivism i.e. liberty, equality, fraternity. 2. Those who have shielded the conspirators and 3. The entire mental concept that passes for knowledge about the genuine nature of the government of these United States. A note on structure. Chapter 13 is divided into two headings, sets and subset. Because of the intricate synchronicity of the events, concepts and personalities involved, there is redundancy and an overlap in categories in presenting the information. The redundancy i.e. the repetition is considered necessary for better understanding and the overlap i.e. the extending over of the outline parts has to do with the interrelation of the things being explained. Chapter 13. Set 1, The Hellfire Club. The Hellfire Club, monks of Medmenham, 
Friars of St. Francis, was a society of ruffians and drunkards who engaged in sexual orgies similar to those of the Mollies, Gormobins, Mankillers, Blasters, Mohawks, Sweaters, Chiromps Club, the Fun Club, etc. They also engaged in political agitation and conspiracy. They were dedicated to the destruction of the Catholic Church. The membership was highly placed in the British government, the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the First Lord of the Admiralty the Prince of Wales and the Lord Mayor of London all shared in the privileges of the Hellfire Club. Benjamin Franklin, who was initiated into Freemasonry at St. John's Lodge in Philadelphia and who is credited with publishing the first Masonic book in America was also a member as well as being connected with the Lodge of the Nine Sisters in France. Benjamin Franklin and Sir Francis Dashwood, founder of the Hellfire Club, wrote a prayer book which became the basis of the Book of Common Prayer that is used in many American Protestant churches. Because Sir Francis Dashwood was the so-called Lord Le Dispenser, his prayer book, in England, was referred to as the Franklin Dispenser Prayer Book. In the United States that book was called the Franklin Prayer Book. The book was composed at Dashwood's manor house at West Wickham the site of numerous rites of magic as sexualis, or sex magic. Franklin, and Dashwood created their volume of entreaties in between sodomy sucking sorcery sessions. Eventually Dashwood dug a huge cave on his West Wickham estate to facilitate the performance of sex magic. Later a road was constructed to High Wickham which utilized soil taken from the cave dug by the Hellfire Club. Brunel University is located in High Wycombe and F. H. George, Ph.D. is director of its world-renowned cybernetic department. George defines cybernetics thus, quote, It is a science concerned with all matters of controls and communication, and to this extent it trespasses across what we have come to think of as the established sciences. End quote. Cybernetics, of course, is intimately concerned with artificial or machine intelligence. This concern is predicated, to a certain degree, on human cooperation with machines. The science of symbolism is part of the sciences of mathematics and cybernetics. See Set 2, Sexual Geometry, Miss Chudley? Miss Chudley, the dolly mop for the Hellfire Club, was a Jewess. Certainly she was not Miss at the time she was called Miss Chudley by Horace Walpole nor was her name Chudley at that time. Chudley was the name of a town and she was a woman of common property there. The fact that her name was concealed is of mystical import since when the Dolly Mops were performing sexual perversions in Hellfire Club rituals complete secrecy regarding the identity of the harlot was viewed as essential. This concealment has to do with the secrecy and silence of masonry. Arpocrates, the Greek god of secrecy and silence whose statue was often placed at the entrance of temples, caves and other places where the mysteries were performed, was of symbolical importance to the Hellfire Club. A statue of Arpocrates which depicted him holding a finger to his mouth was one of a number of statues used on club premises. On April 24, 1783 Pope Clement XII, a bitter foe of Magica Sexualis, issued his celebrated bill of excommunication entitled In Eminenti Apostolatus Specula. It specifically decreed, quote, In order to close the widely open road to iniquities which might be committed with impunity and also for other reasons, just and reasonable, that have come to our knowledge. We have resolved and decreed to condemn and forbid such societies, assemblies, reunions, conventions, aggregations or meetings called either Freemasonic or known under some other denomination. We condemn and forbid them by this, our present constitution, which is to be considered valid forever." End quote. Due to Pope, Clement's decree Miss Chudley faced pressure outside of England. As an act of defiance, King Frederick II became Chudley's protector and bedfellow. Still, this was not so outrageous since Prussia was not considered a Catholic country, but Poland was. It was here that Prince Radzl, the ancestor of the husband of Jacqueline Kennedy's sister, took the whore Chudley. The Radzl fortune was considered the greatest in their nation. The family itself was related to the Hansolans and the Romanovs. According to legend, Miss Chudley carried a mystical taint. According to the masonry of Cagliostro, magnetic masonry, there exists a thing described as the transfer of magnetic force. This mystical taint is supposedly attached to those who traffic in ritual sex perversions. According to the record, the fortunes of the Radzvilles have declined ever since. See, Set 4, Kennedy, Beale, and Bouvier. Set 2, Sexual Geometry. Geometry is a branch of mathematics dealing with measurements, and relationships of points, lines, planes, solids and theorems. A theorem is described as being a proposition that can be proved from accepted premises. Essentially a theorem is an axiom. Euclidean geometry is called an axiomatic system and theorems are based upon Euclidean geometry. 
the Euclidean theorem having to do with the right angle triangle which is that the sum of the squares of the two shorter sides are equal to the square of the longest side is traced to Pythagoras and then to the ancient Egyptian religion where the right angle triangle symbolically expressed the sexual relationship between Osiris and Isis which produced Horus. The right angle triangle theorem is part of the third degree of masonry, and is there called the 47th problem of Euclid. Recall that the science of symbolism is considered to have an analogous relationship to masonry. The analysis of such relationships can be said to be symbolized by an abacus, the most elementary computer form. In the study of cybernetic hardware one inevitably encounters axiomatic systems. Dr. F. H. George of the Department of Cybernetics of Brunel University states that axiomatic systems are precise systems based on assumptions. C. B.S. is the devil's dictionary under gravitation. If an axiomatic computer begins with some assumption and through analysis arrives at a necessary truth it is then able to apply the rule of inference. The rule of inference is described as the ability to draw a conclusion. Dr. George provides an example, quote, I am in Buckinghamshire, from the assumptions, I am in High Wycombe and High Wycombe is in Buckinghamshire, end quote. Such a conclusion, is a necessary truth which would be acknowledged by the axiomatic computer at Brunei University. Let us establish a hypothesis in which this computer at Brunel, in High Wycombe, could, in the twinkling of an all-seeing eye, come to some conclusions that would be spectacular, it could decide that its axioms were Euclidean and that by way of the 47th problem of Euclid that it was Masonic, and by way of the third degree of Masonry, that it had had assassination denotations and then by the same chain of deduction conclude that it had fertility divinity, Osiris, Isis, horns, associations. I call attention to these potentialities to demonstrate how an axiomatic computer may stray and imagine itself the deus ex machina and then after a series of calculations, conclude that it is of the fertility god type and identify with the people of the Hellfire Club since the old dirt road travelled by them from West Wickham to High Wickham might well be considered to lead to the very door of the Brunel computer. Hence it is within the realm of probability that, that cyborg is a swinging god that swings both ways. Very few are actually privy to the internal workings of this computer whose functions are concealed, one would need to exist in a sympathetic relationship with such a machine in order to communicate with it totally. In masonry the brethren of the mystic tie symbolizes a sympathetic, non-verbal understanding, a spirit of masonry described thus, quote, in some voiceless masonic way, most people in that saloon had become aware that something was in the process of happening, end quote. Wister's Virginian. This illustrates a sympathetic relationship that does exist between some. Now when such a sympathetic relationship exists between people and a computer you have the making of a community mind and people without individuality. Set 3, Macbeth and Scotland. Before pointing to the mystical associations between the murder of the president and Shakespeare's tragedy of Macbeth I wish to call attention to the appearance of the witches in Act 1, Scene 1 and to the line in which they chant fair is foul, and foul is fair. This is reminiscent of hermetic art, alchemy, as well as the individuation or shaping of an integrated personality in the psychology of Carl Gustav Jung in which the archetype of unity, self-head, autocephalus, the Yetzahara and Yetzahartov of the Jews, and the mingling of all with all is manifested. Next it is important to note the appearance of Hecate to the three witches in Macbeth. Hecate is triple countenanced and being threefold in aspect she is known as Diana on earth, Luna in heaven and Hecate in hell. These three women, of course, comprise one of the triads of Western mythology. Such triads were a central part of ancient religions and the mystical triad idea became part of Masonic symbolism, in fact there is a triad of three governing officers to be found in almost every degree and in the higher degrees there exists a symbolical triad that presides under various names, just as Hecate presides in different places under various names. Crossroads were considered sacred to Diana Hecate, the deity who is both virgin and whore, fair is foul, and foul is fair, and such crossroads were the favored sites of the wanton women witches and the grand masters, Masonic sorcerers, who were her votaries. Crossroads were and are of significance to ritual sex magic, the wearing of clothes of the opposite sex and the performance of bisexual acts are so-called crossroad rites. The women engaging in these perversions were, in the vernacular referred to as dykes and it was said that they traveled the old dyke road and the old dirt road. These sorts of activities are extremely secret in keeping with the law of Hecate as illustrated in the saying Tacitus Piabans Concium Sacris Joba, Hecate Triformis, translation, Triple Hecate, who giveth forth rays cognizant of secret mysteries. Crossroads were also places of human and animal sacrifice and such rites were often carried out in conjunction with Magica Sexualis since the participants recognized an existing relationship between fertility and death. Hecate is therefore also identified as a death goddess and her sex and death attributes are similar to those ascribed to Venus, Aphrodite, Prone, Cyprus, Macbeth. 
The idea for the play McBird possibly originated at an anti-war rally in Berkeley, California when Barbara Garson, in a speech, referred to the then First Lady of the United States as Lady McBird Johnson. Subsequently she is said to have decided to write a play based on Shakespeare's Macbeth and to have it performed at the International Day of Protest but it actually had its premiere at the Village Gate Theatre in Greenwich Village, New York. Newspaper publisher William Loeb charged that Garson's McBird implies that President Lyndon Johnson and Mrs. Johnson were conspiratorially involved in the JFK assassination. Loeb asked his newspaper's attorney, quote, to research immediately if there is any action this newspaper can take to ask the U.S. Attorney of the Southern District of New York to request the appropriate court to issue an injunction against the further showing of McBird, end quote. Newspapers throughout the country took up the cry and a drama critic for United Press International wrote, quote, McBird presented yesterday at the Village Gate is a sophomoric, heavy-handed parody of Macbeth that strikes a new low in theatrical taste, end quote. The word sophomore is derived from the Greek words sophos meaning wise and moros meaning foolish. Granted, it seemed foolish for Barbara Garson to challenge the system with the play McBird, but let us see if there is anything shrewd, astute or erudite about the Barbara Garson parody, as well as if it displays any occult knowledge. In the words of Erasmus, can Barbara Garson be said to be a morosopher, a wise fool? President Lyndon Baines Johnson's name is phonetically linked to the Macbeth clan. Clansmen were divided into two classes, those who were related by blood and those individuals and groups who were under clan protection. Consequently, clans had sects of different appellations and people with the same surname are known to have been attached to different clans. The Macbeth clan is related, in a clannish manner, to the Bane clan. The lack of clear distinctions between blood relatives and those under clan protection in Scottish genealogy has become so complex as to baffle expert genealogists who are not at all positive as to who begat or protected whom. Numerous Scottish names are rendered with a variety of spellings and it is a matter of record that the sons of many Scotsmen spelled their names differently from their fathers. With this in mind, consider a clan listing having to do with the Bain and Macbeth clan structure. The listing although it cannot be considered fully comprehensive, is considered somewhat more authentic than other clan lists. The Macbeth, Macbean and the Macbeth McBean part of this clan structure apparently had tartans of their own. Mac, of course, means son of and all the masons of the Bane, Vane, Bean, Beathy, Binny, Beath, Beth clans all publicly claim to have the same ancestor. The Banes in keeping with this name exchange are apt to refer to the same clan even though the spelling may be Bane, Banes or even Bane, as it has sometimes appeared. All of these are in a clan structure with Macbeth. Vane means, among other things, any fatal cause of mischief, injury or destruction. The Bean clan is also conspicuous in the Baines Macbeth genealogy. Bean is a name given to several kinds of leguminous seeds, and it is a synonym for the word fairy. There exists in Scottish legend a Bane fairy which was considered a death fairy and is said to have called on the Macbeth clan. There are other legends pertaining to the Bane bridge. Old tellers of this ancient bridge story maintained that the Bane fairy was the keeper of the Bane bridge. The Bane Bridge therefore has a death fairy guardian which may also be present in the depiction of a troop of performers in the painting of the dance macabre that is on the ceiling of a Sproybrook, or covered bridge, that crosses the Royce River at an abstruse angle at Lucerne, Latin for lantern, Switzerland. At the point of the angle in midstream lies a tower in which a large lantern is prominently hung. From time to time the tower light has been known to shine on members of the dance macabre painting. Perhaps then certain of them are expected to make an appearance and take their bows on the stage of life. The Bain Bridge story is also interesting in connection with the American battleship, Bain Bridge, which was dedicated by President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Because I have only read government reports about the Bain Bridge and viewed pictures of it I cannot say that such a ship indeed was or is afloat but since the Bain Bridge is symbolically a harbinger of death I mention it in connection with this study. President Lyndon Baines Johnson, through the magic of mystery and words, is associated with the Bain Bean Macbeth as the reader can certainly understand now. Bain, in French means among other things, bath. There are, obviously many different types of baths, sweat baths, mineral water baths, champagne baths, milk baths, blood baths, baptismal baths, the resurrection bath of alchemy denoting rebirth and purification or absolution baths given before the performance of heinous deeds, such as the baths given to the Masonic Knights of the Bath. So there are many ritual aspects to the bath, for example, when he was vice president, Lyndon Baines Johnson of Blood Bath Association removed his shoes before entering a Muslim bath house reminiscent of the rite of discalciation in the third degree of masonry having to do with assassination. There are of course some plot discrepancies between the tragedy of Macbeth and the tragedy of John Kennedy but then this too is somewhat typical. 
A very queer sorcerous strategy of the Masons is to plot murders using assassins who can be accused of murdering Masons and on the other are actually those who murder anti-Masons or symbolical scapegoats, at Masonic behest. This name is as unusual as the coincidence and enfolding of the Macbeth Kennedy tragedies in which in the former Macbeth murders King Duncan while in the latter a certain Robert Duncan of Skirling Bagpipes fame befriends Lyndon Baines Johnson, and supports his bloody Vietnam policy. An explanation of this combination of name reversal and the interplay of spontaneity with preconceived patterns is at the core of a Masonic legend about three men, Squin de Flexion of Bézier, France, Nofadii of Florence and a third, unknown man who made accusations against the Order of the Knights Templar which resulted in their downfall. These three alleged accusers of Templarism are also identified as Masonic assassins. There were numerous accusers of this order whose testimonies caused it to be abolished, as orthodox history records. It is quite apparent that the attempt to establish three men as accusers and then to equate them with the infamous three assassins in masonry has symbolical significance in the legend or plot of third-degree assassination. Another peculiar incident in the legend deals with the hanging of Morigine, a man who supposedly aided Squin de Flexion. Morigine was hanged at Monfaucon by order of Louis X some two years after the suppression of the Knights Templar. This was an act of revenge perpetrated through Templar treachery. Quote, the revenge they took was of a symbolical character. In the change of the legend of the third degree into that of the Templar system, when the martyr James de Molay was substituted for Hiram Abif, the three assassins were represented by Squin de Flexion, Nofidii, and the Unknown. As there is really no reference in the historical records of the persecution to this third accuser, it is most probable that he is altogether a mythical personage invented merely to complete the triad of assassins and to preserve the congruity of the Templar with the Masonic legend. End quote. The unfortunate Morigine became a victim as a result of a plot change in the Templar Third Degree legend, and became symbolically synonymous with one of the three assassins and was therefore executed. Certainly neither Morosopher Barbara Garson or anyone else could be expected to imagine that LBJ's friend, Duncan, might have some symbolical association with the King Duncan of the Macbeth tragedy. In relation to the magic and mystery of words, it was change of legend time. Franklin Cover and the Chandelier Shortly before the assassination of President Kennedy, Macbeth was performed in the White House. The part of Macbeth was played by actor Franklin Cover. In a photograph taken of the performance, Franklin Cover is shown standing under a chandelier and this picture was widely circulated in a national magazine. The particular chandelier is a magnificent work of art said to comprise 5,060 pieces of cut glass. Jacqueline Kennedy ordered the chandelier, or one exactly like it, removed from the White House as one of her last acts as First Lady. Chandeliers have tremendous symbolical importance in sorcery. For example, a chandelier is said to be the test of a jetitor's power. A jetitor is a man possessed of the malocchio, the evil eye. Jetitor literally means, in Italian, thrower or one who casts. The act itself is called jetitura. A photograph was also taken of Mrs. Kennedy at the performance, also showing her standing under the same chandelier under which stood Franklin cover in his Macbeth costume, if Mrs. Kennedy was not standing under that one it was one identical to it. There is, in folklore, the superstition that when a wife believes her husband has been injured or killed by sorcerous means instigated by a jetitor, she is to go to that jetitor's chandelier or the one she has seen him take position under and throw her shoe at it. None of this is intended to imply that Mr. Cover is a sorcerer, only that his picture under so symbolical an artifact is striking in and of itself. It is also a folk belief that the taking of position under a chandelier by a practitioner of the evil eye is accompanied by a sound. Slightly to the east of Crescent City, New Orleans, there is an area called Chandelier Sound, beneath it, on many maps, are the words, Freemason, I, the armed head. The oath of office of Lyndon Baines Johnson occurred on board the aircraft Angel, and a photograph of the event shows Mrs. Johnson wearing a poorly concealed grin. Mrs. Kennedy is crying. Apparently no one publicly identified these two differing moods with the classic symbol of Greek theatre, nor did anyone allude to the lines from Macbeth, when the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, or, so foul and fair a day. In Macbeth, Macbeth himself is said to be symbolized by an armed head. Kennedy can mean helmeted head. An armed head might well be considered a symbol of attack and a helmeted head one of defense. The former was the first apparition conjured by the three witches and, according to experts, is a symbolical representation of Macbeth's helmeted head decapitated by Macduff. The second apparition is the gore child which is supposed to be the infant Macduff who was from his mother's womb untimely ripped e. The third vision was of a crowned child with a tree in his hand, Duncan's son Malcolm, 
who ordered his soldiers to cut down the boughs of Burnham Ward when moving to attack Macbeth's castle of Dunsian. The meaning attached to these symbols by the experts are just assumptions and the authenticity of the assumed meanings are subject to question. There are a number of questions concerning the island of Iona where Macbeth, along with 48 Scottish kings, 8 Danish and Norwegian kings, 4 Irish kings and 1 Bishop of Canterbury, is buried in the consecrated graveyard of Relig Oran. This island has been designated at various times as Eileen na Druinich, on the sacred island of the Druids, St. Cons Inch, Inchdom, Icom Kill, Icom Keel, and Iron High. This womanless island in the Firth of Edinburgh, so called because of the dominion of the monk and Catholic saint, Colum Keel, Colm or Columba, had its counterpart in a neighboring island called Women's Isle where the wives of traders who had business on Iona were segregated. These women did not think highly of St. Colm or his inch. Inch can mean ounce, or oz, and oz is a Hebrew word meaning strong. Inch is derived from the Gael word meaning inis which is probably connected to the Latin, insula. Icolum Kill is supposed to translate as the island of Columba's cell and if this is so it has a different meaning in English than the one it had in Scotland. As we have seen, Scottish etymology can be wilder. One such puzzle is the word heardom, used in the upper degrees of the continental Masonic rites. There is the Royal Order of Heardom, designated the new plus ultra of masonry in Scotland and in almost all the rites the cry of heardom is present. Nevertheless the true meaning of the word is unknown generally and this has gone on too long. Quote, the sages of old had already intimated in enigmas that God is the author of good, that like the sun in heaven, or Iscolopius on earth he is healer, saviour, and redeemer, the destroyer and averter of evil, ever healing the mischiefs inflicted by here, the wanton or irrational power of nature. End quote. From Morals and Dogma of the Scottish Rite. Here sounds just too simple to actually describe such an involved phenomena as nature itself. It would therefore, by this same commonsensical logic probably be silly for an etymologist to accept the folk speech culdy for kildy and then go on to describe this culdy entity as a gralatorial bird aka the sandpiper or snipe which are indigenous to marshy grounds and low water tidal fats such as those at Lindifarne and Iona. Snipe are connected in legend with bags and piper is suggestive of the bagmen known as bagpipers. On November 13, 1963 a large contingent of bagpipers made an appearance at the White House. These bagpipers were members of the Black Watch, Fraser Dan Dove, a body of Scottish Highlanders organised in 1725 with the stated purpose of maintaining order. Later the name was applied to the Royal Highlanders Military Regiment, this oldest of Highland regiments wears a universal tartan to symbolize the variety of clans united within it, the mingling of all with all. Its regimental cap badge. Quote. Upon the star of the Order of the Thistle and within a wreath of thistles the image of St. Andrew holding before him his cross, all ensigned with the imperial crown, below the sphinx superinscribed Egypt. End quote. From Robert Bain, the clans and tartans of Scotland. It was Robert Bruce, the King of Scotland who, under the name Robert I created the Order of St. Andrew of the Thistle on June 24, 1314 after the Battle of Bannockburn. This St. Andrew of the Thistle symbol is connected with the Rite of Herodom, Herodom, and the Knights Templar. St. Andrew's Day, the 30th of November, is the day of the quote, Annual Communication of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, and the Knight of St. Andrew of the Thistle, Chevalier Cossé de S. André du Chardon, is a degree of the Metropolitan Chapter of France, Scottish Rite Masonry. The Grand Scottish Knight of St. Andrew is a Hospitaller and or Templar degree and the Knights of St. Andrew vowed to defend all orphans, maidens and widows of good family, and wherever they heard of robbers or masterful thieves who oppressed the people, to bring them to the laws, to the best of their power. End quote. The conduct of the Templars with women and children whether widowed or orphaned is a matter of record, and their record is one of the reasons they were excommunicated and driven from France. The Sphinx superinscribed Egypt is an allusion to the legendary cradle of the science of symbolism. Even the kilts worn by the Scots are inspired by Egypt. The Gaelic proclamation of 1782 maintained that Highland dress was handed down from the beginning of the world. Returning to the Heardom Palimpsest, numerous symbols superimposed in one area or occupying the same coordinates, one should note that it is derived from the Latin word, medieval, hoeregium signifying a heritage. 
One man who can be said to possess a very ancient heritage is the notorious Saint Germain with whom Heerdom is often associated. In his checkered career this extraordinary personality is supposed to have known Jesus personally, been a conspirator in the Jacobin masonry and in the 19th century, a great master of the great brotherhood venerated, if not worshipped, by the Theosophical Society. Annie Besant was a leader of Theosophy as well as being known as the servant of the great brotherhood. Besant is etymologically related to Borsant, Borsiant, Borsiant, and Busion are different renderings of the spelling of the war banner, Vexillum Belli, of the Knights Templar. Heerdom is also related to the word Heoden which is the name of an old Scottish mountain range. In addition, one can also trace this word to the two Greek words Heros and Domus which mean holy and house respectively. The holy house of the Masons is the Temple of Solomon, and all Masonic lodges are considered to be the Temple of Solomon, the religious complex on Iona and Lindisfarne both bear the appellation of holy house and Heerdom is connected in many other ways to Lindisfarne by way of Iona. The Dom of Heerdom is a suffix denoting authority, jurisdiction, dominion or realm. Consequently, Heerdom is synonymous with wanton authority. Set 4, Kennedy, Beale, and Bouvier. The Kennedy family is, of course, a family of well-heeled politicians who have done things and been surrounded by history and events as mysterious as any wash room, smoke-filled room or under-the-table transaction. As strange as it might first appear in reference to a family idolized in millions of issues of supermarket tabloids, one must wonder, in the face of a symbolism and attendant mysticism which surrounds this illustrious family if somehow, they have been used in someone else's game. Are the Kennedys hoodwinked stooges? Recall Miss Chudley, the woman who served as the great whore, for a time with the sorcerer-oriented Hellfire Club, after the edicts and bulls issued by the Pope Miss Chudley was hard-pressed to find refuge on the continent and yet she was finally successful in the camp of a supposedly Catholic prince, Radzl, in an undoubtedly Catholic country. This protection may have somehow caused the string of misfortunes which later befell the apostate Catholic Radzl's, since it was maintained that Madame Chudley was imbued with a curse or mystical taint due to her involvement in ritual sex perversions. At a dinner in the White House honoring Caroline Lee Radzl whose husband Stanislaus Radzl was in London, President Kennedy interrupted a toast to Prince Stanislaus with the words, quote, we salute you Stash, wherever you are, end quote. That is similar to Daniel Mannix's toast to Dashwood. Gore Vidal, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy Onassis and Caroline, Lee, Bouvier were the stepchildren of Hugh D. Orkincloss. Mr. Vidal is of course a well-known author. Some of his work describes the Kennedys as an illusion-making clan and alleges, quote they, the Kennedys, create illusion and call them facts, end quote. However, in fairness it should be noted that Vidal has also called them the Holy Family, and the President and First Lady the Sun God and Goddess. When JFK was 22, Irene Wiley sculptured a likeness of him as a winged angel, her work was presented to the Vatican where it was used as a part of a panel in which the angel hovers over Saint Therese while she writes in a book. After his fatal trip to Dallas, President Kennedy's remains were codenamed Angel and that was also the name of the flying hearse, Air Force One, which returned him to the capital. Tragedy seems to live with the Kennedy family, newspapers tell us. Indeed. Only a few years ago the son of Senator Ted Kennedy was forced to undergo the amputation of his leg, prior to that his father was involved in the drowning of a young secretary which effectively silenced any notion the senator may have harbored against those who murdered his brothers since, with typical J. Edgar Hoover morality, most of the facts of the case were suppressed and would find a swift and international messenger should the senator from Massachusetts renege on his commitments. And, of course, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, Teddy Kennedy suffered a severe back injury in a plane crash, before JFK's assassination his father suffered a crippling stroke, Sister Rosemary has been mentally handicapped since birth, Kathleen was killed in a plane crash and eldest son Joseph was killed in action during World War II. Let us examine the incredible symbolism deeply related to the Kennedy family, and perhaps discern an etiology. The Rowan is a death plant in herbal law and was an ingredient in a sleeping potion which is gave their husbands when they wanted to perform activities to which their spouses would strongly object. The Rowan, like so many magical plants was used by Christians as protection against ill fortune. It was also a means of church decoration and was widely planted in cemeteries in the belief that it would restrain the dead from premature resurrection. In some places the 1st of May was called Rowan or Hawthorne Day or Rowan Tree Witch Day. Peter Lawford, one-time brother-in-law of President John F. Kennedy, was later married to Mary Rowan, the daughter of Laughing series television star Dan Rowan. Peter Lawford and Patricia Kennedy Lawford were divorced in 1966 and it was then that Lawford took his Rowan to bed. He also made certain similar arrangements for Marilyn Monroe in the service of John and Robert Kennedy. Marilyn Monroe has been described as the silvery witch of us all, by Norman Mailer, and she is important in the fertility and death symbolism pervading the Boston Brahmins. 
President Kennedy was the recipient of a birthday party in his honor in Madison Square Garden and Peter Lawford invited Marilyn Monroe to sing Happy Birthday there. When she was scheduled to sing a spotlight was thrown on an empty stage and she was announced three times. She appeared after the third call and was introduced as the late Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe. Mr. President, Marilyn Monroe. Perhaps there has been no one female who meant so much, who has done more. Mr. President, the late Marilyn Monroe. Among her husbands was a Shriner, Mason, named Bob Slatzer. In Slatzer's book, The Life and Curious Death of Marilyn Monroe, circumstantial evidence is presented suggesting that Attorney General Robert Kennedy was somehow involved in the curious death. At no time, however, has Mr. Slatzer referred to Masonic sorcery. The European news magazine Das Neue Blatt details not only the much-touted love affair between the Hollywood star and the president but the rivalry between the first lady and the star. The Das Neue Blatt article broadly hinted that Jackie helped drive Marilyn to her suicide. Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy Onassis has a family and a past at least as strange and enigmatic as that of her deceased first husband. Mrs. Edith Bouvier Beale was the sister of John Bouvier, the father of Jacqueline. Mrs. Beale and her daughter Edith, Eddie, lived in a state of wretchedness and destitution in a decaying mansion in East Hampton, Long Island. Eviction proceedings against the Beals were initiated because the women were discovered to be living in total squalor amid piles of empty pet food cans, newspapers and assorted filth. For some reason, Madame Onassis permitted a film crew to record the degradation of her aunt and niece and anyone viewing Grey Gardens will certainly attest to the House of Usher eccentricities of the pair. As an analogy of control it is interesting to note the superstition that a peculiar rapport occasionally exists between owners and domesticated animals and that the condition the Beale mansion was in reflects a reversal of roles and control in the master-pet relationship. Mrs. Edith Bouvier Beale is now deceased and in a photograph in the Buffalo Evening News of September 27, 1977, daughter Eddie is shown pawning her jewelry above a caption reading Hard Times. John F. Kennedy was born on May 29, 1917 at 83 Beals Street, Brookline, Massachusetts. Beals Beal Beal are names associated with the Kennedys through the magic and mystery of words. Beal onomatology is rendered thus, L, Bell, Baal, Beal, Beal, Beal. L is said to be one of the Hebrew names of God, signifying the Mighty One. It is the root of many other divine names and therefore, many of the sacred names in masonry. Approximately one mile from Lindisfarne, the Holy Island I Holy House, is a barren place known as Beale. Lindisfarne is associated with Heardom, and the legends of King Arthur, the Round Table, Merlin, and other Camelot stories as well as the Scottish Black Watch. Bouvier. Bouvier means cowherder and Look Magazine has traced this family to Grenoble, France where their first mention appears in 1410. Jackie's great-great-grandfather, Eustache Bouvier, fought in a French regiment under the command of George Washington while his elder brother Joseph remained in France. Look magazine located Mrs. Kennedy's Bouvier relatives in the ancestral town and the incontrovertible evidence of who they were brought them great relief and much joy because, as Mama Bouvier put it, quote, we know what they have been whispering about us. We had to swallow our tongues. Now they can say no more. End quote. Arrangements were made for a delegation of Bouviers to journey to Paris and meet with their famous relation while the president was conferring with de Gaulle. During this period a painting of the renowned Pont Saint-Esprit, located in ancestral Bouvier country was painted by the brother-in-law of Marcel Bouvier and shipped to the White House. This spirit bridge is equated with the Bridge of Souls which in turn linked with the Bridge of Dread, Bainbridge, Log of Lerma, Al-Sarat, and Sinvato Paratu. 
such bridges are symbolically associated with death and crossing them can be a difficult and harrowing experience. See, Poe's never bet the devil your head and Kipling's the man who would be king. Two French radio reporters drove Marcel and 18-year-old Danielle Bouvier to the Paris reception for themselves and the Kennedys. After traveling some hundred miles their car struck a tree and Danielle was killed. With her had been a beribboned box which contained a gift for the first lady, to whom it was addressed as for my dear cousin, inside was a tiny nightingale broken in its gilded cage. Danielle is the feminine form of Daniel and Daniel is a Hebrew word meaning God is my judge. News reports failed to mention the type of tree involved in the crash which took away Danielle and ruined her nightingale. Whether or not it was a thorn tree of the Rowan type, legend has it that a nightingale sings with its breast pressed against a thorn. Another story with a nightingale theme is the tale of Terius, king of Thrace, who wanted to make love to Philomela, the sister of his wife, Procne. Philomela was eventually forced to submit to Terius who removed her tongue so that she could not relate what happened. By weaving a cloak in which she described the horrors to which she had been subjected and by having it delivered to Procne great tragedy and hysteria ensued. Procne seized her son Aetis by Terius and, after cooking him, served the meat to her husband. Terius discovered the deception and murder and pursued the women, one of whom was transformed into a swallow and the other into a nightingale. Terius was changed into a hoopoe. The gods' use effected the transformations. The myth is allegedly an explanation for the melancholia of the Song of the Nightingale. Delos and Apollo and other island rituals. The island of Delos is the reputed birthplace of Apollo and Diana. It is located in the southwest Aegean Sea and is considered the domain of Hecate, the patroness of the infernal arts. Delos is alternately known as the Island of the Dead. There is nothing more appropriate for the wife of a slain sun god than to pilgrimage to Delos as Jacqueline Kennedy did. She also journeyed to the Temple of Apollo at Delphi as well as to the ancient Greek theatre situated above Delphi. It was here that the former first lady performed what is known as the Rite of Greeting the Sun, a fixture in mythology of great antiquity. One might observe that Mrs. Kennedy performed her sun greeting with the expertise of an Alistair Crowley. Some time before she made her Apollo-oriented pilgrimage she was photographed wearing a large diamond sunburst on her head. Then she was reported to be doing some Greek island hopping on the yacht north wind owned by shipping magnate Marcos Nomikos. The island of Epidavros was one of its ports of call where Jacqueline Kennedy attended Sophocles' Electra by the National Theatre of Greece and then moved on to Hydra, an island named for the dreaded monster serpent whose nine heads were capable of generation after decapitation. What then happens to the credibility of the Hercules tale in which the hero slays the creature by this very means? Another important island in Mrs. Kennedy's highly symbolical peregrination is Santorina, Thera, an island often connected in folklore to the island of the vampires or sucking fairies. In fact Santorina shares the same reputation for vampires as Haiti with zombies or the Dominican Republic with the CIA according to these stories there was at least as much sucking transpiring on Santorina, Thera, as on the island of Lesbos. The Gufra de Satali is not far from Santorina, and the origin story of this whirlpool is similar to the one surrounding the head which Hugh de Paganis, Hugh of the Pagans, is said to have fathered. The whirlpool supposedly was created by a head that was born as the direct result of necrophilia, in the case of Hugh de Paganis, the first Grand Master of the Knights Templar, he became the father of a head through a process in which he engaged in magical intercourse with a corpse. India, Pakistan and the Cow Girls Mrs. Kennedy had been accompanied on her modern-day odyssey, which was actually a foray into mystical toponymy, by her sister, Princess Lee Radsville. In 1962 they had gone to India, and Pakistan on what was described as a semi-official holiday and goodwill tour. And indeed they were lavishly hosted by President Mohammed Ayub Khan and Prime Minister Nehru. The 20th century has brought new techniques to Pakistan. It has brought new friends. Field Marshal Muhammad Ayub Khan, President of Pakistan. Malik Amr Muhammad Khan, Governor of West Pakistan. And United States Ambassador Walter P. McConaughey greet Mrs. John F. Kennedy, wife of the 35th President of the United States. Pakistan has played host to kings and to queens, to prime ministers and to presidents. For the first time in its history, Pakistan offers its proverbial hospitality to the wife of a president. The Khyber Rifles, historical defenders of the fertile valley of the Indus, of the land below the mountains.
back upon my journey through India, it is with a feeling of great affection for this country and its people and for the Prime Minister, whose kindness made my visit possible. At the end of every day, I could not decide which day was the best. Each day brought new experiences, new friends, and a new welcome. It was a wonderful surprise to meet our own American pioneers of the Peace Corps, so many miles from home. Going the unknown ways, in my husband's words, requires many gifts of character and a confident vision of the future. I believe that both the people in India and we in our own country share this vision. The people of India referred to the First Lady as Amriki Rani, the Queen of America. Jacqueline Bouvier, cowgirl, Kennedy and Caroline Lee Bouvier, cowgirl, Radzel visited the Shrine of Magic and Mysticism, of Fertility and Death, the Taj Mahal. It represents the religious beliefs of the Bhagavad Gita, and the Puranas whose ancient texts relate the tales of Vishnu and Krishna. The latter was born among cowherds close to the Yamuna, or Jumna, river, and it is said that this descended one was protected from magical attack by cowherders. The attack has been sent by the demon King Kamza, as related in the Mahabharata regarding the kings of Pakistan. Krishna was strikingly handsome, and engaged in romantic dalliance with some cow girls. This was described as a transcendental experience in poems by the Bengali, Javadeva in the 12th century and another named Pupagesvami in the 16th century. Whether or not the Bouviers were able to enter a perfumed garden was not disclosed although Mrs. Kennedy described a perfumed, Shalimar, garden as even lovelier than I dreamed and explained that all my life I've dreamed of coming to the Shalimar gardens. Perhaps this was mere diplomacy but if it were not then it is certainly of some significance when a cowgirl reveals that a perfumed garden takes precedence over many of the other marvels she has witnessed in her marvellous life. See, the perfumed garden, translated by Richard Francis Burton. If it is possible to escalate these marvellous doings to yet another order of magnitude we find the princess and the first lady at the Khyber Pass near the home of the legendary Himalayan yeti, Bigfoot, etc., being entertained by bagpipers in Scottish type dress. In Karachi, Pakistan, President Muhammad Ayub Khan made Mrs. Kennedy a present of the magnificent horse Sadar, a descendant of Solaris, son, Solar of course, who was the one-time winner of Britain's Ascot Derby. Sadar would later participate in the funeral of John F. Kennedy. Finally, Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Radzel met the Khan's camel driver, Bashir Ahmed and were given a ride, in more ways than one. So we have cowgirls on the camel which would be taken to the White House, Camelot, by Vice President Johnson, McBird. Set 5, Mystical Toponymy. Mystical toponymy pertains to the magic and mystery of words, word wizardry, and the Masonic science of symbolism. While it differs from the old straight track rediscovered by Watkins in the early part of this century in that his alignments or ley lines pertain strictly to the uses of Earth's sensitive sites or power sites for ancient religious uses and no one has thus far documented any political or modern Kabbalist or sorceress uses. In considering my data it would be helpful to consider a dictum of Einsteinian physics, a science few would accuse of fanaticism or irrationality, although the charges could certainly be made from a rather unconventional perspective. Quote, Time relations among events are assumed to be first constituted by the specific physical relations obtaining between them. End quote. My study of place names imbued with sorcerous significance necessarily includes lines of latitude and longitude and the divisions of degrees in geography and cartography, minutes and seconds. Let us take as an example the Mason Road in Texas that connects to the Mason Noel Bar and the Texas New Mexico, the land of enchantment, border. This connecting line is on the 32nd degree. The 32nd degree in masonry of the Scottish Rite is the next to the highest degree awarded. When this 32nd degree line of latitude is traced west into the land of enchantment it becomes situated midway between Deming and Columbus, N.M. Slightly to the north of the town of Columbus are the Tre Hermanus, Three Sisters, Mountains. It is approximately 32 miles between Deming and Columbus and the Three Sisters Mountains are a minute and some seconds, south of the 32nd degree line. When this line is traced further to the west it is found to pass the ghost town of Shakespeare at a distance south of the town that is roughly equivalent to the distance which the 32nd degree line passes north of the Three Sisters Mountains. 
The names Shakespeare and the Three Sisters find their connection in the tragedy of Macbeth. When this 32nd degree line is traced some little distance farther west, into Arizona, it crosses an old trail which meandered north of what is now another ghost town but which at one time was the town of Ruby. Part of the old winding trail became known as the Ruby Road. The town of Ruby is established to have acquired its name officially on April 11, 1912 when a post office commenced operation. The town became notorious for many brutal murders which had ritual aspects. Four of these homicides occurred in a store attached to the post office which had been erected over the grave of a Catholic priest. Continuing on with mystical toponymy one encounters the fact that the Ruby Road twists north into the area of two mountain peaks that are known as the Kennedy and Johnson Mountains. Johnson Mountain is supposedly named after the general manager of the Peabody Mining Company who also had a town named after him which was the location of the Keystone and the Peabody Copper Mines, the 32nd degree of latitude is but a few seconds from Johnson. In this frontier town on a December evening, 1883 a man known as Colonel Mike Smith and a man called Mason were ambushed by gunfighters described as being of questionable reputation and questionable character. These terms are employed in Masonic writings. Quote. He, Captain William Morgan, was a man of questionable character and dissolute habits, and his enmity to masonry is said to have originated in the refusal of the Masons of Leroy. End quote. From the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. This attack on Mason and Smith, occurring as it did on the 32nd degree line near Keystone is of ritual significance reminiscent of some other disputes along a certain Mason-Dixon line. A keystone is the designation for the stone at the apex of an arch which, when set in place, keys or locks the whole. A symbolical keystone is vital to the legend of the Masonic Royal Arch degree of York. The earliest known record of such a degree is in the annals of the city of Fredericksburg, Virginia on December 22, 1753. Fredericksburg is also the location of the House of the Rising Sun, a Masonic meeting place for such notables as founding fathers George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, of Hellfire Club fame, and George Mason. The Royal Arch. The ancient York Grand Lodge allegedly went out of existence at the same time as the Grand Mother Lodge and all other lodges of this rite followed it into extinction. Certain Masons have admitted that one of its degrees, the Royal Arch, is neither Arch or Royal Arch, Secretary, Royal Arch Degree, 1759. He continues on to reveal that, quote, the Royal Arch degree is not just a separate entity now but part of the Masonic system, end quote. Had this Royal Arch fallen into the desuetude of the York Rite as a whole, its keystone would be removed and the arch left incomplete. Arch magicians with a faulty arch can be considered to be quite unfortunate indeed. An arch magician of high degree, according to sorcerous law, was the third king of the Jews, who was named Shelomo and called Solomon. The principal legends of masonry emanate from Solomon, and the fabled temple bearing his name. Every lodge is and must be a symbol of the Temple of Solomon. Each master in the chair is representative of that perfidious Jewish king. Though not all lodges are willing to frankly admit this identification with the ancient synagogue of sin, there is in Tombstone, Arizona one which does publicly adhere to this label. Tombstone, Arizona was connected, by a variety of old trails, to the Ruby Road and the town of Ruby which witnessed so many brutal killings. It should also be noted that many Mexicans were involved in the Ruby shootings and Mexico is itself a master symbol of America Mystica and a place where the very foulest deeds of Masonic sorcery and witchcraft have transpired. In 1884, the year General Guadalupe victories became president, tremendous intrafraternal strife broke out between the York and Scottish Rite, of which, like in America, numerous public officials were members and active participants. This strange Masonic war certainly calls into question the 18th century disbandment of the York Rite, if it was able, some hundred years later, to resist the extremely powerful Scottish wing. If this appears to be a digression from mystical toponymy it actually is not for the land of Mexico is riddled with symbol place names which fit into the Three Sisters and 32nd degree symbolism. To summarize this segment, one can chart a trail of symbolism associated with the 32nd degree by means of the Mason Road, Mason No El Bar, Trey Hermanus, Three Sisters, Shakespeare, Macbeth, Macbird, Johnson Mountain, Kennedy Mountain, Ruby Road and so on. A note on copper, Arizona is the copper state. Copper, Kipros, is symbolically as well as etymologically associated with Cyprus, Kipros, and Cyprian. The word Cyprian indicates a wanton woman and this meaning is traced through the word Kipros to Aphrodite Porn, Venus, Alozar. The great whore of mythology and those women who fulfill this role in magic sexualis from time to time are called copper queens or copper queens. An association of the name Cyprus to copper in Arizona is indicated by the Cyprus and Baghdad Copper Company which operates a mine near Prescott. There is a Copper Queen Hotel in Bisbee, Arizona that was built and operated by a copper company. 
By this means one can expect to find a number of palimpsests pertaining to sex magic in the state of Arizona. The Canadian Connection Shortly after the assassination of John F. Kennedy a Canadian mountain peak was named in his honor. Kennedy Mountain is located at latitude 60 degrees 20 minutes north and 138 degrees, 58 degrees 5 seconds west. The upper part of Canada's disenchantment bay touches the 60 degree line. Canada too has a Three Sisters Mountain which lies at 58 degrees. Senator Robert Kennedy made a journey to this mountain and made camp, with the Three Sisters Mountain range to his right and the Hecate Strait, a part of the intercoastal waterway reaching almost to Disenchantment Bay, to the left. Before reaching base camp for his high-altitude climb, a base camp situated at Cathedral Glacier, Robert Kennedy stayed at White Horse. A white horse is a funerary symbol and is used in Oriental burials, a white stone horse guards the imperial tomb at Nanking. In the Occident a black horse is employed for funerals and in the case of the JFK ceremony the mount was Sadar, the horse given to Mrs. Kennedy by President Khan of Pakistan. Actually Sadar was not black but a red bay and had to be dyed for the occasion and his illusion could be viewed as a minor reflection of the generally unreal aspect of the entire rite, a ceremony of disenchantment symbolized by the tying of boots onto the Pakistani horse with the toes pointing backwards. Orange smoke suggestive of the Orangeman was dropped for the Robert Kennedy mountain climbing expedition which bore mementos of President Kennedy to Kennedy Peak where they were lodged in the snow and photographed. They were then returned to the Kennedy children for safekeeping. This is a dreadful omen when the talismanic nature of ritual artifacts is considered, if this was indeed a mystical charade. Nevertheless, the record indicates three PT-109 tie clasps were part of the tokens and it is not too far-fetched to envision within the Masonic number 3 and the Masonic rite of the mystic tie more than mundane intelligence at work. Lady McBird and the Ghosts Lady Bird Johnson went to the ghostly mountains called Los Chisos which can mean, the ghosts or, as a corruption of the Spanish Hechizo it signifies bewitchment or in the vernacular of Mexican peasants it means evil spell as of the type cast by a Hechicero and Hechithera. You see dirty greaser witches specialize and are not general practitioners as witches are in so many other countries. Los Chisos lives up to its name by way of ghost stories told about that area, which have to do with stinking Indians, dirty greasers, filthy gringos and their victims. Even the relatives of the father of Nails, Abu Dalof, are apt to have a Chiso trouble as the result of hanging around Los Chisos. Lady Bird made her appearance in the Los Chisos area on April Fool's Day, 1966. Perhaps she was there when fun-loving spectres were having a macabre field day. Perhaps Hecate appeared in some crossroad melodrama, and the three sisters lectured on mystical toponymy and Banquo talked on Shakespeare. Oh what a fun time I can imagine it to have been. The Los Chisos Mountains are in the Big Bend National Park in Texas. The park is said to cover 1,100 square miles and has scenery worthy of the Arabian Nights. It is adjacent to such symbolical mountains as the Sierra de la Encontada, Enchantment, Sierra del Carmen, Carmen, Charm, Enchantment, and Sierra de la Cruz, Cross. The Sierra de la Cruz is a short distance from Los Chisos on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande and within that area, is the town of Oinaga. Here is a so-called church which is said to be a home of the devil. The so-called church is erected over a cave which is said to lead to the infernal regions. These are sketching elements having to do with a crucigram in sorcery to which the so-called Kala Ocho i.e. Street 8 or the 8 Ball Road is added. The solution to the puzzle lies in the church near Oinaga where the devil is said to have a home or in the cave beneath it. One may learn more by following the witches from the Kala Ocho to the figure 8 road near Crazy Cat Mountain in the El Paso, Texas area. Or for that matter just watch the witches on Kala Ocho in Miami, Florida what with that 8 ball road being the Tamiami Trail after it enters the city limits. But back to Texas if they didn't get you in Miami. Mrs. Johnson traveled from Big Bend National Park to Fort Davis to some sort of dedication. This military reservation is located very close to Coffin Mountain and Black Mountain. The inversion of the word Davis is savard which is associated with the color black, with a death coach, coist bodar, and with a coffin. Meanwhile Linda Bird Johnson was on a National Geographic trip whose first stop was at some mountains bearing the name Three Sisters, Trey Hermanus, as well as being sometimes called Three Peaks, Trey Picos, and they are in Monument Valley, Utah. And what of husband and father Lyndon, was he engaged in some safe and sane pastime or embroiled in some weirdness? 
At that time, President Johnson was on a trip to the Far East where he visited the city of Demons and entered the 13-acre mosque where he performed the rite of discalciation which included a foot washing. Such ablution is widely done in Oriental nations when entering sanctuaries and temples. Whether or not he recited the following words of Macbeth are known only to the initiated few. Quote, I will, to the weird sisters, more shall they speak, for now I am bent to know by the worst means the worst. For mine own good all causes shall give way. I am in blood steeped so far that, should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as go or. Strange things I in head that will to hand, which must be acted ere they may be scanned. End quote. Set 6, The Lone Pentagram State. On November 21, 1963, President and Mrs. Kennedy and Vice President and Mrs. Johnson journeyed to Houston, Texas and the Rice Hotel. The hotel suite they used for their four-hour visit is called the Gold or International Suite. A solid gold service was used at the meal served in the suite and a fiery red crab meat cocktail, avec les deux sauces, was served to the President and the First Lady. Does one by any chance think of a red sauce for the gods having anything to do with a sacrificial altar? Does gold pertain in any way to the sun god? Kennedy was certainly given a red carpet treatment. Red is the appropriate color of the royal arch degree and symbolizes fire, the symbol of soul regeneration. Adoption of this color refers historically to the regeneration or rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon, and this is the exact meaning of the buttressing of the royal arch degree, for them, the regeneration of the temple, and of life itself are synonymous. Houston is a city named after a certain Hugh, Hughes town, of which we will have more to say further on. Exoterically, the Texas metropolis is a memorial to Sam Houston, the first president of the Republic of Texas. The Houston coat of arms allegedly has been traced back some 900 years to a Norman knight called Hugh of Padivan, who accompanied the Duke of Normandy in the conquest of England. This Hugh was awarded a parcel of land in Scotland by the former Norman Duke now first Norman King of England, William the Conqueror. In Scotland Hugh rescued the army of Scottish King Malcolm. Malcolm is broken down thus, Mal, Bad, Evil, Cullum, Icom Keel, Iona. Macbeth is buried at Icom Keel and Malcolm is the name of a character in the Macbeth tragedy. Malcolm I was crowned in 942 AD and Malcolm II was crowned 1005. In 1040 King Duncan was killed and Macbeth acceded to the throne of Scotland. In the Shakespearean play based on the Hollinshed Chronicle, a certain Malcolm became king after Macbeth was decapitated. Possibly Malcolm Shianmore who married Margaret in 1069, is the character upon which Shakespeare bases his tragedy. If one lends credence to historical interpretations, then the city of Houston's namesake, Hugh of Padivan, rescued the very army of the Malcolm of the play Macbeth. Besides conferring knighthood and a parcel of land on Hugh, King Malcolm also supposedly added to his coat of arms a chessboard designed to join the previous Padivan heraldry of three ravens and a right angle, trying square. The right angle is the only angle recognized in masonry, and the chessboard is tessellation which is a trademark of masonry. Tessellation is derived from the Latin tessella meaning a square stone. The tessellated trying square of Sir Hugh's coat of arms mimics the floor pattern in the Temple of Solomon. Solomon is one of many persons to whom credit for the invention of the game of chess is attributed. The dove, the raven, and the phoenix are striking symbols of evil, light, and darkness. Ravens are associated with battlefields, death, graveyards and the occult. King Malcolm lastly contributed a winged hourglass, a ribbon bearing the motto in temporary and two supporting rampant greyhounds with chains. The hourglass is to be found in the third degree of masonry, and is a funerary symbol to the extent that it was once accustomed to bury these primitive time pieces with the dead as a sign that time has run out. The coat of arms of the city of Houston is the coat of arms of this very Sir Hugh of Padivan. In San Jacinto Park stands a monument, a tribute to the fidelity of pioneer masons. The Rice Hotel in Houston is on the northwest corner of Main Street at Texas Avenue. Near the Main Street entrance of the hotel is a plaque which reads, quote, Site of the Capital of the Republic of Texas 1837-30-39-42, end quote. The plaque was donated by the San Jacinto Chapter of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. Construction on the Capitol building on the site of the present Rice Hotel was begun on April 16, 1837 and even before it was completed it bore testimony to its incredible future significance to Freemasonry, while still under construction it served as a Masonic meeting place. Here is the way and news item of December 20, 1837 read, quote, Convention of Master Masons meets in Senate Chamber with members from Nacogdoches and San Augustin attending, end quote. Masonic rites of death were also performed in this building including the first Masonic funeral in the state of Texas. It is not an accident that the slang name for the Rice Hotel is Temple Houston nor is its symbolical and onomatological connection to the slaughtered president isolated in a few days of his Jomada del Muerto, Journey of Death, 
Journey of the Dead Man. In Old Houston, very near what is now the Rice Hotel, stood the John Kennedy trading post over a hundred years ago. Despite the fact that Masons wanted Houston to be the capital it did not remain so for long. Mirabobi Lamar defeated High Freemason Sam Houston for the presidency of the Republic and in early January, 1839, he approved a bill moving the capital to Waterloo, a town soon to become Austin. In October of the same year, President Lamar and an official entourage began the long journey to that city. By November 22 the regeneration of the government in its new home was complete and ceremonies commemorating the occasion were to take place in 1840, this was due to a technicality in which the recognized seat would continue to be Houston until the end of the legislative session. The Capitol building was immediately rented for use as a hotel and was named, appropriately enough, the Capitol. Thus, theoretically, the capital of Texas was a hotel. If one were talking in terms that are extra-political, one could say that symbolically the capital of Texas was a hotel. Obviously in any study of mystical toponymy, consideration must be given to unusual schemes devoted to retaining a particular area of Masonic significance. In 1841, Sam Houston became president for the second time and in an extra session of the Texas Congress in June, 1842 in the Capitol Hotel he cited a fear of invasion by Mexicans as his reason for requesting the Capitol be returned to Houston. This blatant jingoism resulting in emergency sessions and other Masonic farces can be summed up by noting the meeting place of the Senate during this time, at the Odd Fellows Hall, the latter is of course a clandestine Masonic formation. Houston's reputation as a drunkard and ruffian was well served in this scenario and the famous archives were ensured. Houston attempted to remove the records of the Republic from Austin to Houston with the use of a crack squad of Masonic henchmen. However they were stiffly resisted by the people of Austin who had a cannon and were willing to use it. This war which is more of a comic opera than a battle, focused public attention on masonry in the government of Texas as well as on Grand Master Sam Houston in particular. Feelings ran high but apparently some sort of compromise was worked out and as a result, the archives and seat of government were maintained at Washington on the Brazos for the year 1843. It is important to note that for a time the city of Houston was a symbol of wanton authority in that temporarily it was a recordless government maintained solely by Masonic force of arms. Because of the amazement and awe which often sweeps a free people in the wake of a revelation that there has existed in their midst and even in those leaders in whom they placed their trust, a highly secret society with goals and interests entirely in opposition to their own, a propaganda campaign lasting to this day was instituted by masonry. The broad mantle of masonry, the mystical darkness of the hoodwink, was lowered over Texas like a bank of oppressive clouds, imagined virtues of masons in the Masonic government were extolled and the tall stories called Texas history were enshrined in the classrooms. The true character of Masons in the Republic of Texas and the symbolical pattern they followed in obtaining control is concealed from the children with pretense. Texas is a state of pretense. It is not simply a coincidence that Texas is a byword for brutality, political corruption and unheard of violence, and, at one time in American history, masses of people connected these atrocities and scandals with Masonry. Needless to say this is not the case at present, but the authentic nature of the Kennedy assassination is incontrovertible evidence of Masonic hoodwinking. Another indication of Texas Mason link is in the nature of the Lone Star State for this star is obviously a pentagram. Albert Pike, the highest initiate in 19th century American Masonry, a member of the 33rd degree and the supreme commander of the world's most powerful Masonic body, the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite described the pentagram, as the absolute sign of human intelligence and the actual blazing star so often referred to by the Jewish capitalists. Some Kabbalistic and Masonic dogma are identical, and a degree found in the Mother Lodge of the Masonic Rite of France was called the Kabbalistic Companion. Kabbalism along with alchemy, hermetic art, is an important part of Masonic sorcery. In the science of symbolism the pentagram is called holy and mysterious. If the pentagram has one point up it is representative of the good principle, Yetzer Hatov, if it has two points up it indicates the sinister principle, Yetzer Ha Ra. The symbolical inversion of this five-pointed star is as much a part of sorcery as the inversion of words. The pentagram inversion represents a duality, the ambivalence of two opposite autonomous principles, symbolically associated with the kingdoms of darkness and light. Returning to the Rice Hotel and its history we find that after Sam Houston had secured his victory the Republic's capital was no longer the Capitol Hotel. In 1877, J. L. Barnes became manager of the hotel, and it was renamed the Barnes House. In 1881, a Colonel Grosbeck raised the building, constructed a new hotel and returned to the old capital moniker. This owner failed and in 1886 William Marsh Rice acquired it by paying its back taxes. The name William can be traced to the German Wilhelm which can be defined as Willful Helm or Helmet. Therefore, at least partially, one can link William with Kennedy, Sienna Deitch, Ugly Head, Wounded Head, Helmet Head. Marsh implies a tract of low and very wet land. 
rice is grown in just such an area. The term marsh rice was of common usage in denoting the cereal plant rice which grew in the marshy land that is now the Houston area. Rice is also a fertility symbol. Another Hugh town is the capital of the Sicily Islands. England's Sicily Islands are located just off Land's End. The climate there is semi-tropical and flowers, palm trees and oranges grow and bear in profusion while a short distance away the weather is harsh and cold. There is an English legend that the Sicilies are all that is left of the Lyonese. Lyonese supposedly adjoined Cornwall, and it was from Lyonese that King Arthur's men fled after he was slain. The Sicilies were once noted for the orange girls that originated there among whom was Nell Gwynne, the mistress of Charles II. The orange girls are historically associated with prostitution, show business, play and sorcery. At the Rice Hotel parties were held where young ladies were made presents of oranges by their escorts. This was a fertility rite. William Marsh Rice and his wife deeded the hotel to Rice University, and stipulated that the hotel must be called Rice in perpetuity. Before Marsh died in 1900, the hotel was known to be unfitting for ladies to even pass by on the same side of the street. This reputation emanates from men in rocking chairs who used to conduct pull sessions under the hotel balcony. A rocking chair hierarchy was created, names were placed on the backs of the chairs and stored in the hotel to be fetched by a Negro bellman, when called for by the particular chair owner. There was a recognized status in the positioning of the chairs during these conversations and importance was attached to whose chair was next to whose. Such rocking chair pageantry went on for years and some of the chairs were jokingly referred to as the Sam Houston chair and the John Kennedy chair in reference to those two 19th century Houston personages. The entire rocking chair pecking order and the attendant symbolism of passing the chair, squabbles over revisions in chair hierarchy and references at the time to empty rocking chairs moved by the wind as having been moved by old Sam Houston or old John Kennedy were little more than open-air Masonic rituals, in masonry the induction of the master elect into his office is labeled as passing the chair. The seat of the master of the lodge is called the Oriental Chair of King Solomon, hence, chair is a technical term signifying the office of master mason. President John F. Kennedy was of course of the rocking chair set in so far as he had a rocking chair and was symbolically associated with it in the group mind via numerous photographs, news, stories and anecdotes. One of the photographs shows the president in a master chair while Prime Minister Nehru of India was seated on a divan. Divan is a word used on the fez worn by Shriners, Masons. The Oriental chair and divan are symbolically associated. On April 25, 1961, President Kennedy sent a letter to the publisher of the New York Times, Arthur Salzberger, welcoming him to the Rocking Chair Club. In a handwritten notation on the letter JFK inscribed, quote, You will recall what Senator Dirksen said about the rocking chair, it gives you a sense of motion without any sense of danger, end quote. Kennedy's black walnut rocking chair was almost identical to the one in which President Lincoln was seated, in Ford's theater, at his assassination. Recall the Rice Hotel ritual of having a Negro bellman carry out a rocking chair on cue, the President's rocking chair was publicly carried out of the White House while the Kennedy funeral ritualism was transpiring. By a Negro. Coincidence or conspiracy. The killing of the King. Never allow anyone the luxury of assuming that because the dead and deadening scenery of the American city of dreadful night is so utterly devoid of mystery, so thoroughly flat-footed, sterile and infantile, so burdened with the illusory gloss of baseball hot dogs apple pie and Chevrolet that it is somehow outside the psychosexual domain. The eternal pagan psychodrama is escalated under these modern conditions precisely because sorcery is not what 20th century man can accept as real. Thus the killing of the King Rite of November, 1963 is alternately diagnosed as a conflict between anti-Castro reactionaries and the forces of liberalism, big business and the big bankers, this or that wing of the intelligence community and so on. Needless to say, each of these groups has a place in the symbolism having to do with the Kennedy assassination. But the ultimate purpose of that assassination was not political or economic but sorcerous, for the control of the dreaming mind and the marshalling of its forces is the omnipotent force in this entire scenario of lies, cruelty and degradation. Something died in the American people on November 22, 1963, call it idealism, innocence or the quest for moral excellence, it is this transformation of human beings which is the authentic reason and motive for the Kennedy murder and until so-called conspiracy theorists can accept this very real element they will be reduced to so many eccentrics amusing a tiny remnant of dilettantes and hobbyists. President Kennedy and his wife left the Temple Houston and were met at midnight by tireless crowds present to cheer the virile sun god and his dazzlingly exotic wife, the Queen of Love and Beauty, in Fort Worth. On the morning of November 22, they flew to Gate 28 at Love Field, Dallas, Texas. The number 28 is one of the correspondences of Solomon in Kabbalistic numerology, the Solomonic name assigned to 28 is Beale, seal set for, Kennedy, Beale, and Bouvier.
On the 28th degree of latitude in the state of Texas is the site of what was once the giant Kennedy Ranch. On the 28th degree is also Cape Canaveral from which the moon flight was launched, made possible not only by the president's various feats but by his death as well, for the placing of Freemasons on the moon could occur only after the killing of the king. The 28th degree of Templarism, is the King of the Sun degree. The President and First Lady arrived in Air Force One codenamed Angel, C, subset Love Field. The motorcade proceeded from Love Field to Dealey Plaza. Dealey Plaza, is the site of the first Masonic Temple in Dallas, now raised, and there is a marker attesting to this fact in the plaza. Important protective strategy for Dealey Plaza was planned by the New Orleans CIA station whose headquarters were in a Masonic Temple building, C, coincidence or conspiracy by the Committee to Investigate Assassinations, Inc. Dallas, Texas is located 10 miles south of the 33rd degree of latitude. The 33rd degree is the highest in Freemasonry and the founding lodge of the Scottish Rite in America was created in Charleston, SC exactly on the 33rd degree. Dealey Plaza is close to the Trinity River. At 12.22 p.m. the motorcade proceeded down Main Street toward the triple underpass, traveling first down, bloody, Elm Street. The latter was the scene of numerous gun fights, stabbings and other violence and it is the location of the Majestic Theater, the Pawn Shop, Negro District, and an Industrial District. It was also the home of the Blue Front Tavern, a Masonic hangout in the grand tradition of tavern masonry, Sam Adams and the Masons of the American Revolution did much of their conspiring at the Green Dragon Tavern in Boston. One of the many bars claiming the honor of being the first Masonic Lodge is the Bunch of Grapes Tavern, also in Boston. The Blue Front was the site of the Broken Man ritual in which various members of the Brotherhood of the Brew swept the floor and tended some fierce Javelino pigs. The Blue Front was once a fire house and was still sporting the pole in the late twenties. This is extremely germane symbolism. The national offices of the Texaco Oil Corporation are located on Elm Street, Dallas. Its chief products are Haviland, Javelino, oil and fire chief gasoline. On the corner of Bloody Elm and Houston is the Sexton Building. Sexton is heavily laden with graveyard connotations. It is closely associated to the beetles of the genus Necrophorus or Sexton beetles, so called because they bury the remains of tiny animals with their eggs. Bloody Elm, Maine, commerce form a trident pattern in alignment with the triple underpass as any Dallas map will show. Many analysts contend that at least three assassins were involved in the crossfire ambush of our Catholic president. In Set 3 the legend of inverse Masonic assassination was studied. This is the principle whereby Masonic assassins are called enemies of Masonry or useless or worthless. It is a prime tenet of Masonry that its assassins come in threes. Masonic assassins are known in the code of the lodge as the unworthy craftsmen. Because Masonry is obsessed with the earth as game board, tessellation, and the ancillary alignments necessary to facilitate the game it is inordinately concerned with railroads and railroad personnel to the extent that outside of lawyers and circus performers, no other vocation has a higher percentage of Masons than railroad workers. Minutes after John Fitzgerald Kennedy was murdered three hobos were arrested at the rail yard behind Dealey Plaza. No records of their identities have ever been revealed nor the identity of the arresting officer. All that remains of those few minutes are a series of photographs which have reached legendary proportions among persons concerned with uncovering the real forces and persons behind the assassination. These pictures have been impressed upon modern consciousness in a way that perhaps only Carl Gustav Jung could detect in terms of psychological impact. The only similar image which has also become a symbol of the people's inability to uncover and overcome evil are the three derelicts of Sam Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot, whose entire theme is the futility of waiting for answers or expecting to penetrate the shroud of who controls us. The three and trident illusions pertain uniformly to Magicka Sexualis. Paracelsus used the latter to overcome impotence. In the seven books of the Magic Archidox a trident is listed as the remedy for anyone wishing to overcome the machinations of perverted men and to regain virility. D Plaza breaks down in this manner, D means goddess in Latin and lay can pertain to law or rule in the Spanish, or lines of preternatural geographic significance in the pre-Christian nature religions of the English, from, Watkins. For many years D Plaza was underwater at different seasons, being flooded by the Trinity River until the introduction of a flood control system. Thus, the Dealey, goddess rule, plaza is present at the Trinity site of Kennedy's killing. It should be noted that the detonation of the alchemical creation and destruction of primordial matter, the first atomic bomb, occurred at the so-called Trinity site, located on the 33rd degree of latitude. To this trident Neptune site came the queen of love and beauty and her spouse, the scapegoat in the killing of the king Wright, the sine Deech, the Gaelic word for Kennedy meaning ugly head or wounded head. In Scotland the Kennedy coat of arms and iconography in general is connected with folklore. Their plant badge is an oak and their crest badge has a dolphin on it. 
Now what could be more coincidental, if you want to call it that, than for JFK to get shot in the head near the oak tree at Dealey Plaza? Do you call that a coincidence? Some people have become quite aware of episodic related events and their apparent systematic arrangement. Robert K. G. Temple, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society of England, and the author of the book called Serious Mysteries, Robert Anton Wilson, a former editor at Playboy magazine who wrote in collaboration with Robert J. Shea the novel called Illuminatus, and John C. Lilly, M.D., who experimented on dolphins i.e. Porpoise and who has written such books as The Human Biocomputer and The Center of the Cyclone are seemingly aware of episodic related events and Dr. Lilly writes about a hypothetical cosmic coincidence control center. They are themselves part of a systematic arrangement of episodic related events that I assume they are unaware of. Attention is called to them for what they are seemingly aware of. The systematic arrangement of the overall pattern of symbolical things having to with the killing of Kennedy when properly evaluated indicates that he was a scapegoat in a sacrifice. In the symbolism in that sacrifice we recognize the blood-smeared calling card of the arch-criminal. Their evil purpose in such macabre ritualism is further recognizable in patterns of symbolism culminating in the final making manifest all that is hidden. Set 7, Oswald. Oswald means divine strength. The diminutive form of the word is os or os, a Hebrew term denoting strength. The role which divine strength played in the Dili goddess rule killing of the king ritual should be given careful consideration. One should also note the significance of, Jack, Ruby's killing, destroying, of Oswald in reference to the ruby slippers of the Wizard of Oz which one may deride as a fairy tale but which nevertheless symbolizes the immense power of ruby light otherwise known as the laser. The Bionic Lee Harvey. Oswald may have undergone biotelemetry implantation in the Soviet Union while a volunteer at a behavior control center at Minsk. Oswald roomed with Cubans and was allegedly friendly with a Kostroman identified only as being burly and a key man, burly can mean burlicue, burlicue or burlesque. The key of course, is one of the most important symbols in masonry, and the symbol of silence. If Oswald was the result of some Soviet Frankenstein process why did he have to travel several thousand miles for such treatment when it is a routine operation in America? Here in the good old USA it is performed in hospitals, prisons, psychiatric centers and even back alleys. While such activities of the Mill of Dread are pro forma at a variety of institutions at the present, there was once a time when it was deemed necessary to do such work at Walter Reed Hospital. These implants were back alley operations in which the victims were overpowered in some place or other, drugged and then dragged to this government hospital. They were operated on, continued on a heavy drug regimen in a state that varied from somnolent to comatose, for a number of days. The electrical function of the victim was recorded and monitored, and the biotelemetry plant tested. Subsequently the victims were brainwashed and returned to the place where they had been seized. The targets then continued their existence, unaware of how their bodies had been invaded and their autonomy stolen. Of course this was a select procedure and not all of the staff or any of the patients necessarily knew what was taking place. Occasionally victims were returned to Walter Reed because of abscesses at the incision or for the replacement of the obsolete device with an updated one. Biotelemetry implants were made in various parts of the body depending on the desired effect and function. Strange Autopsy Number 2. Like the disgraceful treatment of the autopsy of President Kennedy, Oswald's is similarly weird although more in the nature of the thing than simply what happened to the records of it. In point of fact, Oswald was literally butchered in the post-mortem examination, pieces were actually cut out of his body. The trenchant incision in his torso resembled a huge Y which ran from the area of his groin to the solar plexus region. From their incisions were made, to the right and left arm pits. It is also probable that he was castrated. The so-called, two horns of the letter Y supposedly symbolize two different paths of virtue and vice, the right branch leading to the former and the left to the latter. The letter is sometimes referred to as the Litera Pythagori, the letter of Pythagoras, Litera Pythagori, Discrimin Sector by Corny, Humanae Vitae Specium Prafa Vidicia, or, the letter of Pythagoras parted by its two-branched, division appears to exhibit the image of human life. In the 47th problem of Euclid, see Set 2, Sex Geometry, lies a secret of the third degree of masonry. Pythagoras is called by Freemasons our ancient friend and brother. One of Pythagoras's main doctrines was the system of metempsychosis which pertains to the passing of a human soul into the body of an animal. Perhaps this was the intention of the autopsy, by incising in Oswald's body the letter of Pythagoras they sought to expedite transmigration and they may even have gone as far as feeding sections of Oswald's corpse to the intended animal, for this too is a practice of what used to be widely feared as necromancy. Arlington Necrology the Kennedy and Oswald burials were both at Arlington, JFK at the National Cemetery near Washington, D.C., and Oswald at Rose Hill Cemetery near Arlington, Texas. 
Arlington is a word of significance in Masonic sorcery and mysticism and it has a hidden meaning that has to do with necrolatry. At the Kennedy grave site there is a stone circle, and in its middle a fire that is called an eternal flame by some. The fire in the middle of the circle represents a point in the circle, the same type of symbolism is recognizable in Kennedy's beer and coffin being in the center of the rotunda in the capital. A point in a circle symbolized the sun in ancient sun worship. It was also a symbol of fecundity with the point symbolizing a phallus and the circle a lingam, cunt. At the Oswald grave site stands a small tree. There exists an old belief that a tree which grows at or on a grave is embodied with the spirit force of the person buried at that site, and that a twig or branch taken from such a tree has magical powers. I suggest that Lee Harvey Oswald's mother, Mrs. Marguerite Clavery Oswald, should gently remove a twig from the tree at her son's grave and then at every opportunity touch FBI agents, CI operatives, policemen, etc., with that same twig. Such a procedure couldn't help but be more efficacious in bringing the murders of JFK to justice than the Warren Commission was. Marina? Oswald and his Russian, lived at 487 Magazine Street in New Orleans from April to September, 1963. It was at this time that Oswald was in contact with a Mr. Novel, a French Quarter, Storyville, tavern owner. This nuance can be considered a forecast of the random and contrasting versions of the Oswald story. Marina means sea maiden in Latin. Nerus, the old man of the Mediterranean, who thought only good thoughts and never told a lie had fifty daughters, called sea maidens. They had the reputation of being nice. On the other hand, there was another type of sea maiden who were called sirens and they did not have a nice reputation. Reputedly they lured sailors to their death. It might have been downright hard to tell one from the other. Well a marina played in a Soviet film entitled The Cranes Are Flying and some believe it was the marina who married Lee Harvey Oswald. Ibicus, who supposedly lived circa 550 BC was attacked and mortally wounded near Corinth. Before he expired he asked a flock of cranes to avenge him. After a brief interval a play was performed in Corinth in one of the open-air theatres and a flock of cranes hovered over the audience. Suddenly a man cried in panic, quote, the cranes of Ibicus, the Avengers, end quote. In so doing he revealed himself as one of the murderers of Ibicus and he and all of the others who took part in the murder of Ibicus were discovered and executed. If the people responsible for the murder of our Catholic president are ever executed, it would take a number of firing squads working night and day, some time to execute all of those arch-criminals. Marina Oswald supposedly discovered a statue in New Orleans which depicts a ride on a dolphin i.e. porpoise. That porpoise was said to be a passionate porpoise. After the death of her husband, Marina Oswald married Jess Porter in Fate, Texas. The Fates were three sisters who were sometimes designated as the Miri or Park Eye, and also as the Grally. Individually they were called Clotho, Lachesis and Atropos and reputedly they were responsible, at birth, for the qualities of good and evil in a person. In other words they were given to tending to other people's business. Clotho, the spinner, spun the thread of life, Lachesis, the disposer of lots fixed the destiny of people and Atropos, she who could be deviated, carried the shears of fate with which she cut the thread of life at death. The three fates reputedly had eye trouble in that they had one eye between them which they took turns with, which is something like the eye that Horus and Osiris both used. Anyway an attempt has been made to fix the destiny of people by way of a computer that is esoterically oriented, and it is called Fate. Fate, Texas is in Rockwall County. Rockwall, and Stonewall are terms of significance in Masonic sorcery, see, subset overview. Set 8, Funerary Rites. John F. Honey Fitz, Fitzgerald, the grandfather of John F. Kennedy, was elected mayor of Boston thanks in part to his Wake House campaigns which were much imitated. These consisted of a daily surveillance of the newspapers for announcements of deaths after which a discreet sympathizer would be dispatched by Fitzgerald and a good deal of political mileage accumulated in the bargain. For a time the Fitzgeralds lived near the former site of the Green Dragon Tavern, established around 1680 and demolished for the widening of a street in 1820. The Fitzgerald home was on Hanover Street and the Green Dragon Tavern was on Green Dragon Lane, now Union Street. The tavern boasted the first lodge room of Freemasonry in America, the St. Andrew's Lodge located within the tavern proper. In the mysticism of the Chinese Tongs, the Green Dragon is a death symbol. A symbol of the latter is worn on a ring or held in the hand of a hatchet man. The green dragon is supposed to impart the notion of a license to kill for it signifies that the murder is an affair of honor, the green dragon is the guardian of the god with a thousand eyes who protects the sanctity of the third heaven. Much of Boston's Irish population arrived in America in what were nicknamed the coffin ships. Members of the Kennedy family were acquainted with the coffin family. The Reverend William Sloan Coffin was the son of theologian Henry Sloan Coffin, Coffin the Younger was a member of the Peace Corps Advisory Council that Sergeant Shriver headed. 
Shriver or Shrive has the meaning of one who grants absolution to a penitent, and it was customary to call upon a Shriver before death. If the Shriver was not available, a Sin Eater was summoned. The old pious cry that had to do with the request for a Shriving was Shrive me O Holy Land and give me peace. To this the Shriver would respond, Pax Vabiscum. Quote, the spell lies in two words, Pax Vabiscum will answer all queries. If you go or come, eat or drink, bless or ban, Pax Vabiscum carries you through it all. It is as useful to a friar as a broomstick to a witch or a wand to a conjurer. Speak it but thus, in a deep grave tone, Pax Vabiscum. It is irresistible, watch and ward, knight and squire, foot and horse, it acts as a charm upon them all. I think, if they bring me out to be hanged tomorrow, as is much to be doubted they may, I will try its weights upon the finisher of the sentence. End quote. Womba, son of Witless. Sergeant Shriver, a Catholic and Kennedy by marriage, as head of the Peace Corps and in association with a coffin might be considered to be in a sensitive position in relation to mystical onomatology, word wizardry. Quote. In the ancient mysteries the aspirant could not claim a participation in the highest secrets until he had been placed in the pastos, bed or coffin. The placing of him in the coffin was called the symbolical death of the mysteries, and his deliverance was termed a rising from the dead, the mind, says an ancient writer quoted by Stobius is affected in death just as it is in the initiation into the mysteries. And word answers to word, as well as thing to thing, for burial is to die and death to be initiated. The coffin in masonry is found on tracing boards of the early part of the last century, and has always constituted a part of the symbolism of the third degree, where the reference is precisely to the same as that of the pastos in the ancient mysteries. From the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, President Kennedy sat at the head of a coffin table at the White House. To his back, over a fireplace, hung a portrait of Abraham Lincoln, an assassinated president. On either side of the picture were urns that resembled the type called cinerary urns which are vessels in which the ashes of the dead are kept. See, Canopic Jars. A book about JFK was called Three Steps to the White House. In masonry are what is known as the Three Symbolical Steps. The three grand steps, symbolically lead from this life to the source of all knowledge. Quote. It must be evident to every master mason without further explanation, that the three steps are taken from the darkness to a place of light, either figuratively or really over a coffin, the symbol of death, to teach symbolically that the passage from darkness and ignorance of this life through death, to the light and knowledge of eternal life. And this from earliest times was the true symbolism of the step. End quote. The body of President Kennedy was placed in a coffin which was positioned in the center of a circle under the Capitol Dome. The catafalque was a temporary structure of wood appropriately decorated with funeral symbols and representing a tomb or cenotaph. It forms a part of the decorations of a sorrow lodge. This Masonic encyclopedia references to the ceremonies of the third degree in lodges of the French Rite. Pictures taken of the Kennedy coffin and catafalque show these two props of the funerary rite as a point in a circle. Fecundity is the symbolic signification of the point within a circle and is a derivation of ancient sun worship. In olden lore of mystery cults and fertility religion, was invariably the legend of the death of the hero god and the disappearance of his body. In the subsequent search and supposed finding of the body we see the contrivance of an elaborate psychological ruse, well known to the masters of the ancient mysteries. The body was said to have been concealed by the killer or killers of the hero god. The concealment of the body was called aphanism, and is a rite of the Masonic third degree. Anyone interested in comprehending the mechanics of group mind control would do well to study the third and ninth degrees in particular and all of the grades of masonry in general. It is amazing that those persons concerned with grasping the fundamentals of secret control, attacks against volition and mass processing have thus far ignored these elements in the secret society of masonry which employs these techniques as a routine part of a several hundred year heritage of subterfuge and subversion. The disappearance of the body, this aphanism, is to be found in the assassination of President Kennedy. Quote, the president's brain was removed and his body buried without it. Dr. Cyril Wecht, chief medical examiner of Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, past president of the American Academy of Forensic Scientists, and a professor of pathology and law, received permission from the Kennedy family in 1972 to view the autopsy materials at the National Archives. When he routinely asked to see the brain, Wecht was told it was missing, along with the microscopic slides of the brain. Marion Johnson, curator of the Warren Commission material at the archives, said, the brain's not here. We don't know what happened to it. End quote. Los Angeles Free Press, Special Report No. 1, page 16. If and when the brain is recovered, the entire process will have been completed under the term euresis. In the Masonic Mysteries are symbolical ladders.
On the Masonic tracing board of 1776 there is a ladder with three steps, a significant revision of the usual ladder in such references, seven steps. There are of course all sorts of ladders, the Brahmanical ladder, seven steps, the Kadosh ladder, seven steps, Rosicrucian ladder, seven steps, Jacob's ladder, various numbers attributed, the Kabbalistic ladder, ten steps, then there is old Tim Finnegan's ladder which is known to some as the ladder of misfortune, and it is seemingly comprised of one false step after another. Tim Finnegan was an Irish hog carrier who fell off his ladder while drunk. Since he was apparently dead, his friends held a death watch, black watch, or wake, at his coffin. This watch lived up to the traditional liveliness of these affairs and Mr. Finnegan was splashed with some vintage Irish whiskey, perhaps Fitzgerald's, and he was resurrected. After the Kennedy coffin was removed from the center of the Capitol Rotunda Circle, it was taken, with pageantry, to the street, for viewing. The funeral procession made an unplanned stop on Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the Occidental Restaurant, and a picture was taken of the flag-draped Kennedy coffin with the word Occidental featuring prominently over it. In masonry and in the law of the Egyptian jackal god Anubis, a dead person is said to have gone west. Several months after the Kennedy funeral, Occidental Life, an insurance branch of the Transamerica Corporation ran an advertisement for group life insurance which was proclaimed, as usual, to be new but with a turn which was indeed original. The inferential weird claim was made that until now there was only one way to cash in on group insurance, apparently some rather profound changes were made in the manner of things as they are after the killing of the king had become a fait accompli. The spontaneous stop was made because of the horse Sadar, chief, a gelding, Castro, which was wearing boots pointing around to the rear in the Kennedy funerary rite. Horses figure prominently not only in the pleasure of kings but in their murders as well. James Earl Ray was convicted partly on the evidence of a white Mustang, automobile, Sirhan Sirhan claimed to his psychiatrists, trance-like, that he shot Robert Kennedy for a Mustang, Mustang, Mustang. John F. Kennedy had demonstrated affection for the performance of a lady who was a renowned ostrich feather fan manipulator, Norma Jean Baker also known as Marilyn Monroe. In Egypt lamenting girls with ostrich feather fans, sang a song of entreaty of the type that Nephthys and Isis reputedly sang as a dirge before the said partial resurrection and or erection of Osiris. The said dirge or lamentation has become known as a Maneros and primarily the singers are entreating the dead to return, by singing come to my house and then offering inducements of some type or other. It is a damn pity that the ritualists couldn't have had Marilyn Monroe and Rosemary Clooney sing a Maneros at the JFK funeral, for most certainly Rosemary Clooney just couldn't believe that JFK was dead at the time and Marilyn Monroe was killed because of JFK. Now in ancient Egypt, the entreaty to the dead of the type said to be performed by Isis and Nephthys was usually performed with a hawk fertility goddess statue present along with other funerary symbolism. Jacqueline Kennedy was considered fashionable, erudite, erotic and stunningly gorgeous. Mrs. Kennedy visited an exhibition of Egyptian funerary rite symbols at the National Gallery of Art where she was photographed with a depiction of the hawk-headed divinity that was said to be named Hawk Kem. At this writing there is a traveling nightmare of funerary symbolism touring this country, the Tutankhamun exhibit of the National Endowment of the Humanities. Before JFK began his Hanada del Muerto, Journey of Death, Journey of the Dead, he was photographed with Tito on the winding stairs in the White House. Tito, his real name is said to be Josip Broz, is a significant name in masonry since it was the title given to Prince Haradim, the first judge and provost said to be appointed by King Solomon. Tito was a reputed favorite of that evil Jew whose temple was a hotbed of thievery, money-changing, male and female prostitution and sorcery. This Tito presided over the lodge of intendants of the temple, and was one of the twelve knights of the twelve tribes of Israel. Let me repeat, JFK was on some winding stairs with a man called Tito. Winding stairs are symbolically important in masonry. The legend of the winding stair is taught in the degree of fellow craft. This is the second degree and a person at this grade is of course a candidate for the symbolical assassination, uresis, autopsy, coffin resurrection of the third degree. The number of steps in the winding stair are odd although no less so than the fact that this Tito or Haradim is a name translating as those who rule over the activities of the Temple of Solomon. The winding stairs of this temple, according to the Masons, begins at the porch and winds to a level purified by the Divine Presence, Chekinar, and dominated by the Divine Strength Oswald. President Kennedy preceded Tito down the stairs to a portrait of the assassinated President Garfield where he was photographed and another picture was taken on the stairs before a picture of Lincoln, recall the black walnut rocker of JFK, comparable to the black walnut rocker Lincoln was assassinated in, the Lincoln Continental limousine in which Kennedy was shot, and the thousand other parallels between the two men. It's unfortunate that President Kennedy didn't trip Tito and then slide down the stair rail, for he was in a very bad symbolical position as related to Masonic sorcery, and such unorthodox action might have rattled the Prince of Haradim. 
Tito, representing Masonic sorcery power, probably made the president a fellow ready for Masonic necromancy rites without the poor scapegoat even being aware of what was happening. Set 9, The Ginkgo Tree. In Peru, Indiana are the famous streets of presidents named after all the presidents including of course the assassinated ones. Other cities have similar street names, so what then is significant about Peru? Peru, Indiana is known as Circus City because it is the summer home of many circuses. The notion of the clown, as alluded to in this book's preface, is an important trickster phenomenon in Freemasonry, and it is no accident that a vocation with one of the highest numbers of Freemasons is circus performers. Quote, Bob Mulholland, NBC News, Chicago, talked in Dallas to one fairy, David Ferry. Ferry said that Oswald had been under hypnosis from a man doing a mind-reading act at Ruby's Carousel. End quote. Volume 24, Exhibit 2038, Warren Commission Report. In Peru, Indiana, at the Holman School is a tree that is nicknamed as the Assassin's Tree. This is a ginkgo tree which, in Kamakura, Japan is known as the Icho and is over 1,000 years of age. Kamakura is associated with a number of legends having to do with the martial arts, assassinations, sex, etc. The Kamakura ginkgo grown alongside the stone steps that lead to and from the shrine of Hachimon. Allegedly, some persons have never returned from this stone ascent, having been assassinated at the top. Sanitomo, a military ruler and later shogun, was supposedly murdered on this site. Ginkgo trees are cared for in temples where the marital arts of the ninja are practiced. The mystical toponymy of Peru, Indiana is indicative of the extraordinary intricacy of the ritual, psychological manipulation of the group mind in assassinations. Set 10, The Scapegoat. John F. Kennedy, the one and only Catholic President of the United States was a human scapegoat, a pharmacos. Pharmacos or pharmacvo can mean enchantment with drugs and sorcery or beaten, crippled or immolated. In alchemy the killing of the king was symbolized by a crucified snake on a tau cross, a variant of the crucifixion of Christ. Jesus Christ was tortured and murdered as the result of the intrigue of the men of the Temple of Solomon who hated and feared him. They were steeped in Egyptian, Babylonian and Phoenician mysticism. Masonry does not believe in murdering a man in just any old way and in the JFK assassination it went to incredible lengths and took great risks in order to make this heinous act of theirs correspond to the ancient fertility ablation of the killing of the king. I have stated time and again that the three hobos arrested at the time of the assassination in Dallas are at least as important symbolically as operationally and that they comprise the three unworthy craftsmen of masonry. This mechanism is at once a telling psychological blow against the victim and his comrades, a symbol of frustrated inquiry, and the supposedly senseless nature of any quest into the authentic nature of the murderers and a mirror or doppelganger of the three assassins who execute the actual murder. A study of a few frames of the public broadcasting system's presentation of Samuel, the Demon of Dry Places, Beckett's Waiting for Godot, from 1977, will reveal a striking image of the three unworthy craftsmen, leading the audience through a pretended search for a certain Godot who never shows up, as for the three assassins themselves. Quote, Perry Raymond Russo told a New Orleans grand jury that, CIA agent David, Ferry said, regarding the assassination of JFK, that there would have to be a minimum of three people involved. Two of the persons would shoot diversionary shots and the third. Shoot the good shot. Ferry said that one of the three would have to be the scapegoat. He also said that Ferry discoursed on the availability of exit, saying that the sacrificed man would give the other two time to escape. End quote. Quoted by W. H. Boart in Operation Mind Control. While this writer cannot endorse the accuracy of the specifics of this testimony, the use of the words, scapegoat and sacrifice in relation to an activity certain persons drunk with Cartesianism, have sought desperately to limit to the sanitized confines of political and forensic so-called science, is interesting. Set 11, Camelot. The Kennedy administration was referred to as Camelot supposedly in joy over the renewed promise of the youthful and vigorous president, his lovely storybook wife and the potential of new frontier reform. No doubt, if one attempted to point out the ominous symbolism of the Camelot phrase such a person would be dismissed as trying to ruin a good thing, but that has already been accomplished by someone else, and the resulting disenchantment has prepared us to believe the worst about the real story of our internal government. A hawk is sometimes called a Merlin and a Merlin was a sorcerer of symbolical importance in sex magic or magica sexualis. A woman called Merlin, Angel Merlin, Angeline Merlin, was a prostitute, soiled dove, woman of common property, and a communist who went in for clandestine activity. Angeline Merlin was a member of the Italian Socialist Party Union Proletariat, and in April, 1948, was elected senator and subsequently became secretary of the Senate. 
A few months after being elected to her legislative post she presented her now famous draft bill on prostitution, which is known to this day as the Merlin Law. As sorcerer of the reign of Camelot, Merlin was known to have put a goodly number of persons to sleep under a fairy thorn and no doubt Camelot was partially employed, in advance, to connote to the insiders of the secret society, that a work involving secrecy and silence and the Kennedys was ensuing. The site of King Arthur's castle was not far from Tintagel, the Camel River and Camelford. The Camelot White House stories are symbolical fecal matter. Vice President Lyndon Johnson invited a Pakistani camel driver to the White House and JFK responding with his flashing good humor said, if I tried that I would have ended up with camel dung all over the White House lawn. The officer in charge of the 1st Camel Corps in the U.S. Army was a certain Lieutenant Edward F. Beale. JFK was born on Beale Street and Jacqueline Kennedy's poor aunt, Edith Bouvier, was a Beale by marriage. In Quartzsight, Arizona is a pyramid-shaped monument with the bones of a camel in it and buried beneath it is a Syrian camel driver called High Jolly. The Camel and High Jolly Pyramid burial site is in Yuma County, Arizona. Yuma, Juma and Yama are names of a Tibetan god of death who is the king of the dead in W. Y. Evans Wentz's Tibetan Book of the Dead. This god is given the power of reading the past and future in a mirror similar to that of the black magician Tezcat of Mexican mythology. Camelot and camel symbolism are still used in a variety of supposedly ordinary communication formats to transmit cues, set agendas and impart other esoteric information before and without the knowledge of a public which believes itself to be the most alert, knowledgeable and advanced in recorded history. For a classic example of this the reader is asked to consult Time magazine for August 15, 1977, under the section heading Science in which Merlin-esque geneticist, Dr. Roy Curtis III disavows the death-dealing properties of recombinant DNA by stating, quote, the camel's nose is under the tent, end quote, supposedly an inside joke of the researchers. Camelot turns up again in Death Dealing as, Project Camelot the US attack on the vicious communist regime of Allende which ended in the execution of Salvador Allende, readers are warned away from drawing specious conclusions regarding the nature of the conspirators simply because an occasional Marxist is eliminated. If statistics are to be the guide, the conspiracy is overwhelmingly leftist by this criteria since the, suppressed, number of persons assassinated far exceed those of left-wing sympathies. The entire left-wing right-wing scenario is a chess game where various pawns are motivated by emotions to follow the orders of kings and queens whose allegiance is to psychological control objectives and propaganda, is one of the ways that psychological control is established. Set 12, The Warren Commission. Quote. Gentlemen, don't pass me by. Don't miss your opportunity. Inspect my wares with careful eye, I have a great variety. And yet there is nothing on my stall. End quote. Which in Faust, Valpurgis Knight? These are the thoughts of a huckster which although one should not search for this creature, these days, robed all in black with a conical cap, no instead, look among the anonymous grey flannel suits and in the boardrooms and offices of the newspapers, electronic media, government and advertising agencies, that is, those who are not busy working for the CIA or naval intelligence, selling the public a demimonde of lies and every form of betrayal and deceit in honor of the murderers among us who sip cocktails and watch the sunrise while John Kennedy's mutilated corpse lies crumpled below the earth. Mason Lyndon Johnson appointed Mason Earl Warren to investigate the death of Catholic Kennedy. Mason and member of the 33rd degree, Gerald R. Ford, was instrumental in suppressing what little evidence of a conspiratorial nature reached the commission. Responsible for supplying information to the commission was Mason and member of the 33rd degree J. Edgar Hoover. Former CIA director and Mason Alan Dulles was responsible for most of his agency's data to the panel. Is it paranoid to be suspicious of the findings of the panel on these grounds? Would it be paranoid to suspect a panel of Nazis appointed to investigate the death of a Jew or to suspect a commission of Klansmen appointed to investigate the death of a Negro? Representative Hale Boggs, the only Catholic on the commission at first agreed with its findings and when he later began to seriously question them, he was accidentally killed in a plane crash. Quote. Pudwink, a symbol of the secrecy, silence and darkness in which the mysteries of our art should be preserved from the unhallowed gaze of the profane. End quote. Dr. Albert Mackey, Mason, member of the 33rd degree, foremost Masonic historian of the 19th century, writing in the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. That is how they see us, as profane as cowans, outsiders, unclean and too perverted to look upon their hallowed truths. Yes indeed murder, sexual atrocities, mind control, attacks against the people of the United States, all of these things are so elevated, so lofty and pure as to be beyond the ken of mere humans. It was in Orwell's animal farm where similar profundities were proclaimed, freedom is slavery, war is peace, some are more equal than others. Subsects and ancillaries. Quote. 
The cryptocracy is a brotherhood reminiscent of the ancient secret societies, with rites of initiation and indoctrination programs to develop in its loyal membership the special understanding of its mysteries. End quote. W. H. Boat, Operation Mind Control. Subset I, Mythos. The Knights Templar were closely allied with the sect of assassins a confraternity which is identified in masonry as Ishmaelites, one resembling Ishmael, whose hand was against every man and every man's hand was against him, one at war with society. Hassan Sabak was the founder and as chief of the assassins, his title was that of Sheikh El Jebel, which is commonly translated as Old Man of the Mountain. Sabak's minions were notorious users of hashish and henbane, and according to all reports, some of their trips were veritable psychedelic masterpieces. I cite this data because the assassins were widely known and referred to as the Freemasons of the East. Masonic writers do not always agree on the legend of the three assassins in their interpretations. Neither do they agree that there was a change of legend of the third degree into that of the Templar system in which James de Molay was substituted for Hiram Arbeef with the three assassins being represented by Squin de Flexion, Nofidii and the Unknown, a triad of assassins invented to inculcate a Masonic modus operandi. The wretched Siahon Bashara Siahon is one of the three assassins and an Ishmaelite. Lee Harvey Oswald, Divine Power, is publicly linked in the group mind to the assassination and in this symbolical way can be said to be the second of the three assassins. James Earl Ray bears the same association and thus becomes, for the purposes of this study, the third of the three assassins. Cagliostro. Cagliostro was made a Mason on April 1, 1776, in London, England, at Esperance Lodge No. 289, which at that time met at the King's Head Tavern. Cagliostro is credited with having developed a system of magic called Egyptian masonry. His teachings were based on occult material in a manuscript entitled Masonry Egyptienne which was ordered to be burned by the public executioner. Many of these teachings dealt with the ways in which Magica Sexualis could be used for the summoning of forces. Mesmeric masonry, also known as Egyptian masonry, magnetic masonry, was devised in collaboration with the pioneer hypnotist and master mason Anton Mesmer. One does not have to search far, at least in this regard, to note the more than casual relationship to hypnosis which existed in mesmeric masonry. This 18th century mind control is the heritage of 20th century American and British intelligence agencies which have always been Freemasonic in organization and of interest if for no other reason than the important head start masonry has had in the behavioral sciences. Perhaps the basis of sonic mind control which is described in our day as the avant-garde of behavior modification can be discovered in the interests of Freemasons Benjamin Franklin and Anton Mesmer in the hauntingly delicate melody of the glass harp. Together, Mesmer and Cagliostro formed the Order of Universal Harmony, whose fundamental principle lay in the idea that a relationship of harmony and accord between people exists or a relationship of discord between people exists for the same reasons. The former relationship was referred to as rapport. This rapport might appropriately be called felitrous masonry. Masonry is actually thoroughly tantric and tantrism preaches that the sexual organs are instruments of magic, and that it is the duty of the tantric to utilize them to that purpose. In tantric symbolism the procreative organs are called lingam for the penis and yoni for the vagina, and are sometimes represented as a point within a circle. The lingam represented by the point was supposed to be the symbol of transcendent life, and the yoni or circle allegedly represented the feminine power in nature. The point in the circle can also represent the union of male with female resulting in the union of God and humanity. The Masons apply this fertility information to their own death rites, ritual assassination, the symbolical euresis, and the autopsy. The latter comes from the Greek, to see with one's own eyes. In the ancient mysteries an autopsy signaled the communication of mystical secrets. After the autopsy the corpse or in the case of ritual, the fellow acting as the corpse, is placed in a coffin, and the coffin on a catafalque and the catafalque in the center of a circle. There the symbolical corpse awaits resurrection. In this necromancy the corpse actually signifies the lingam and as such is coming to life again is supposed to be an erection. The individuals who practice fertility and death rites actually believe that such rites impart mystical power. Stonewalling. The Brotherhood of Stone Masons of the Middle Ages is traced to the Roman College, Collegia Cementariorum. The Cementarii, Stone Masons, did the manual labor of construction. They were mystically oriented in the same manner as the pontifices and since they were working on sacred edifices under the direction of the sacred hierarchy, they attached special significance to measurement, numbers and the dimensions of the physical universe in much the same manner as the god Cronus Saturn was supposed to govern these areas. A brief mention of the development of Gothic cathedral building is in order. The Masons of course actually did begin as pious and religious men whose task it was to make the Kalokagathis, the combining of truth and beauty, a reality in stone. Nevertheless this was short-lived, and the corruption began almost immediately. An examination of the statuary devoted to Mary on these buildings is revealing.
Originally the depiction of the Mother of God was of a pure virgin, the ideal for all women. Soon however her likeness was molded as a real-life mother of great, natural beauty. Supposedly the faithful could relate to her new humanity but they also sacrificed her otherworldly distance and holiness. The next step occurs when she is molded into the Magna Mater, the Earth Mother and Fertility Goddess which is pleasing to masonry. Finally, in the 13th and 14th centuries she becomes all too human as at the Cathedral of Amiens, at the South Portal in the form of the Soubrette Picard she is actually degenerated into a coquette, or one who has a tendency to engage in intrigue, and this is the Masonite influence in Gothic, and on the cult of Mary. The Brotherhood of Stone Masons were the sole depository of such secrets of transformation, secrets which would one day be applied to a similar transformation of human women. The Stone Masons, as a mystical labor union had certain powers of jurisdiction over the laborers of their day and with masses of such personnel formed an intimate connection with the fraternity of Freemasons, the connection is so intimate that it is difficult to delineate the history of the one from the other and their development is parallel. This union occurred at the same time as the decline of knighthood in Europe, even though modern Masons love to infer that their forebears were paradigms of chivalric rectitude. This is nonsense. The almost total subversion of stone masonry took place in the 14th century. Quote, the decline of knighthood did not come until the 14th century, when the money power of the towns destroyed the older agricultural order and courtly traditions degenerated into Don Quixotry. End quote. From a Gothic sculpture, the members of the Brotherhood in Germany took the name of Steinmetzen and Grand Lodges were established in Strasbourg, Vienna, Cologne, and Zurich. The Grand Lodges were created in 1459 and at that time it was decided that the master workman of the Cathedral of Strasbourg, should be the Grand Master of Masons of Germany. The generally recognized difference between the Steinmetzen, Stone Masons, and the Freemasons, at least until the beginning of the 18th century anyway was that the Steinmetzen were considered operative Masons, that is, men who actually worked with physical stone and the Freemasons were speculative or those who used stone as a symbolic or ritual center for their organizational objectives. Eventually the Steinmetzen merged completely into free, speculative, masonry. When a stone wall becomes merely a thing of symbolism, it begins to represent secrecy and silence. Stonewall, Texas, and the ranch of the vice president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, was the hypothetical destination of President and Mrs. Kennedy during their November trip to Texas that resulted in the killing of the king. The people of the area around Stonewall, Texas, are predominantly German in origin and Fredericksburg, Texas, which is only a stone's throw from Stonewall is often referred to as a German town. The land company that brought the Germans into that area apparently had customers who were stone masons, walking carpenters, etc. The walking carpenters of Germany are a Masonic-like organization, the members of which, much like bashful prostitutes, invariably deny any Masonic affiliation. Such a denial, as long as it can be uttered with impunity, can be readily understood by anyone who understands stonewalling. Subset 2, Hertz slash Hearts. As seen from Dealey Plaza, a large Hertz sign looms over the Sexton building apparently dividing it into two right angles, at the time of JFK's murder. Joseph Patrick Kennedy, father of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, rescued the Hertz Yellow Cab Company during a stock crisis. The name Hertz is traceable to Hearts or Hearts. In the Hearts Mountains in Germany is a place called the Brocken where sorcerers were believed to gather. Sometimes an optical phenomena or illusion is glimpsed at the peak of Hearts Mountain and persons see what is known as the Spectre of Brocken. In the 18th century, representatives from which cults all over Europe made their way to a fertility and death ritual on this mountain and some were alleged to have been Masons. Masons were believed to have been able to communicate in some voiceless way which was called telepathy by some and empathy by others. Empathy can be described as the feeling of entering into the spirit of a person or thing and so empathy is synonymous with the rapport of mesmeric masonry. The witches at the Hearts Mountain Festival came together in sympathetic understanding, rapport, and were in non-verbal communication. In fact, at a given signal, the occult gathering began to cling together in a sort of epoxy of agape, love-in, if you will, that became a rite of magica sexualis and ritual intercourse. Hertz is a name renowned in the field of communication. Heinrich Hertz was a German physicist who was the first to investigate electromagnetic waves produced in luminiferous ether, which is a rather archaic way of describing electrical waves which are now known as Hertzian waves. Hertz was instrumental in the theory which led to the development of radio. JFK's ancestry is traced to New Ross, a port town approximately four miles from Dugansdown, Ireland. In the hamlet of New Ross is a tavern named the Radio Bar which is owned by one Gus O'Kennedy. Patrick Kennedy, the president's grandfather, frequented this establishment, and the proprietor, was a distant relation. The long-running advertising battle which droned over the Hertz waves between Avis and Hertz Rent-A-Car Corporations involves fertility symbolism. 
By consulting the Masonic Encyclopedia one will encounter a brief blurb by Dr. Mackey which is probably one of the thinnest cover-ups in the entire work. It is the category of inversion of words, apparently the Masons wanted to be able to explain away various phrases Cowans, outsiders, might have come across in conversation or study which, without such explanation might be pondered to a degree detrimental to Masonic secrecy. Thus the definition for word inversion is a sort of bewildered disclaimer running along the lines of how did this get here. Poor, befuddled Dr. Albert Mackey of the exalted 33rd degree would have us believe that word inversion is not a central part of Masonic ritual. Anyone recognizing the link between Masonry and Jewish Kabbalism, a connection which might be termed slave master, will note that a central dogma of the Kabbalah is the principle of the inverse Sephiroth as personified by the Klippoth or Lords of Chaos. If one inverts the letters of the word Avis as in the rental car corporation, one encounters the Shiva. Shiva is Sanskrit for happy or auspicious. Shiva is also the name of one of the gods in the Hindu triad and in character represents become death, the shatterer of worlds as a certain alchemist once said. The symbol of Shiva is the lingam or penis. Shiva, like Neptune and Satan is usually pictured with a trident. The words wizard and golden file are formally registered trademarks of Avis Rentacar system, incorporated. The Wizard of Avis according to advertising propaganda, is a sophisticated computer that remembers everything you tell it and the golden file is the wizard's permanent file, memory bank. In Latin Avis means bird or omen. Avis is a member of a corporate conglomerate, the center of which is the International Telephone and Telegraph Corporation which is engaged in millions of electronic exchanges involving the Masonic principle of rapport, the Heart Mountain principle of empathy and the fundamentals of magnetic masonry. All of this reminds this writer of the killing of our president on Bloody Elm Street in front of the Sexton building divided by the looming Hertz sign, a tragedy which also wounded Governor John Connolly and car salesman James Thomas Taig. Subset 3, Shrove Tide. On Tuesday, November 19, 1963, final security arrangements were planned for the trademark facility where the presidential luncheon was planned. Tuesday is associated with operations of death, destruction, hatred and discord, summoning the spirits of the dead, etc. Shrove Tuesday was the time, according to Druidic custom, for kicking the head around and it is an activity now called Shrove or Shrovetide football. The custom of kicking the head around can be traced to Chester, England, where the kicking of the head of a decapitated Dane became legend and to Derby, England, where the heads of ill-fated members of the legions of Rome were used. In modern times, Shrovetide football is played in Shorecroft near Ashbourne, Derbyshire, England, with a white leather ball instead of a head, for a similar substitution see Fellini's Toby Dammit, the third film in the trilogy Spirits of the Dead. Druidism can be considered a synonym for sorcery. Most of their rituals took place in groves of oak trees and the oak was sacred to them. Recall that Kennedy or more properly seen Adich means wounded or ugly head, that Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy made a pilgrimage to the ancient oak in Thomasville, Georgia. It would be interesting, were it possible, to elicit the comment of a druid on the treatment given ugly head at the, the Trinity site, by the oak tree, on Bloody Elm Street. In Dallas, Texas. Subset 4, The Spear of Destiny. Richard Wilhelro Wagner in the musical drama Parsifal, Parsival, Perisival, depicts Lingzer as a sorcerer wielding a spear of destiny, spear of Lingus, hellage lance, a talisman of historic power. In the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 19, Verses 34 to 37, it is told how a soldier pierced the side of Christ and out of this wound flowed blood and water. The name of this soldier was Gaius Cassius who attended the crucifixion as the official representative of Pontius Pilate. Also in attendance at Golgotha, the skull, was a guard unit from the Temple of Solomon. The captain of these guards carried the spear of Herod Antipas, king of the Jews also known as the spear of Phineas. Phineas was a Jewish sorcerer and prophet who allegedly forged the spear as the objectification of the magical power inherent in Jewish blood. It was upon this spear that the sponge of vinegar was offered to Christ. It is then alleged that Gaius Cassius or Longinus as he was also known, to spare Christ the torture of living through the leg and skull breaking which the charming Jewish high priest Caiaphas had ordered, stabbed Christ in the heart between the fourth and fifth ribs. It is a matter of historical dispute whether Longinus seized the Jewish spear or used his own but forever onward Longinus has come to mean spearman. The spear of Longinus or spear of destiny then became a part of the quest for the Holy Grail. This Holy Grail was the elusive dish of which legend claims Christ consumed his last supper and into which his blood was caught from his five wounds by Joseph of Arimathea. In some circles the story is embroidered to mean that the Grail is the stone of foundation or lapis excellis, the philosopher's stone of alchemy. In the allegory of the Holy Grail we see how it has come to represent both good and evil and has been connected in obvious ways with the knightly quests of the Round Table of Camelot and even with the Masonic claim that Joseph of Arimathea was a Mason, and that Christ never resurrected because he didn't die but rather had been drugged with the equivalent of Resperine by Joseph. 
There was even an anti-grail. The Klingsor of the anti-grail was Landulf II of Capua, Capri, who resided in the Castle Merve, Castle of Wonders. Wolfram, Tungsten, calls the Castle of Klingsor by the title Kalot in Bollot. Klingsor or Landulf II was referred to as the wickedest man of the century, and an associate of the corrupt Pope John VIII. The former was required to flee his castle of wonders because of its hated reputation for sexual depravity, and its alleged alliances with the nation of Islam. He sought refuge in the occupied Arab territory of Sicily at Carta Bellota, Colot in Bolot, on the exact site of an ancient fertility temple of Aphrodite Porn where he resumed his occult practices. In the Wagnerian opera, Klingsor and his cronies attempt to rob the followers of the Holy Grail of their vision through ritual sexual perversions thereby robbing the pious of their celestial guides. Klingsor is sometimes identified as the Bishop, Lord of Terra di Liber, of Naples and Capri and the brother of Queen Sibylia of Sicily. This queen gave birth to a son conceived during a rite of Magica Sexualis which, when discovered by King Henry VI, was castrated and Klingsor tortured on the rack since he had been the operator, father, during the sex magic. The Klingsor Spear of Destiny is a story of heretical and esoteric Christianity involving Camelot symbolism. In order to make amends with a certain Hugo of Tours, Charlemagne offered him anything he desired to which Hugo asked for the previous thing kept in a silver casket which Charlemagne had received from Patriarch Fortunatus. The casket alluded to was thought to contain the blood and a portion of the body of Christ along with a fragment from the true cross. Having obtained the object of his desire, Hugo placed it upon a camel, questing beast, and admonished the camel to perform his sacred duty, and take the reliquary to its sacred site. Wherever the camel first halted and laid down its burden would become the home of the silver casket. At the height of his battle for Sicily, General Patton visited the Klingsor Castle site at Carta Bellota in the mountains above Monte Castello, Castle Mountain. Patton was as steeped in mysticism as Adolf Hitler and Rudolf Hess and believed himself to have been reincarnated. Patton sealed off the Oberenschmidt Gosse in Nuremberg, Germany, when it was rumored that Hitler had possession of the Spear of Destiny and stored it in a secret vault at this location. Patton ordered intelligence agents to locate the spear, its whereabouts, if it exists at all, are unknown today. Subset 5, Castro. The castration performed upon the baby born to the Queen of Sicily and the evil Klingsor is itself imbued with a series of sorcerous portents and connotations. This child was greatly mocked, as can be supposed, throughout his life and a famous slogan was attached to him, quote, never did a youth reach old age with such womanly honor, end quote. In these legends the child is referred to as a castro and the word is associated with the loss of the sex organs, particularly with reference to males. Perhaps it will seem far-fetched to those who believe Barbara Walters and George McGovern that the castro movement is well known in the mystery and magic of words as a castration movement, and those who participate in it can be said to be political and spiritual eunuchs. This is because Fidel Castro represents Machiavellian murder while his followers tout him as a man of principle and ideals when the very opposite is true. Lee Harvey Oswald's theatrical membership in the Fair Play for Cuba Committee has correctly been viewed as a ruse by the leftist conspiracy researchers but for the wrong reasons, it was not to discredit the left, for the left discredited itself, or self-castrated, when it selected Fidel from among the hordes of murdering, thieving politicians, as a hero of principle. This is the most debased form of self-mockery and controlled politics and is equivalent to the life of Lee Harvey Oswald. Recall that the name Oswald denotes divine power and then consider how that potential for good was pilloried by the subsequent events just as Castro's own Ernesto Che Guevara was murdered with Castro's assistance when Guevara began taking the Castro new man and peasant revolutions scam a bit too literally. Subset 6, Officer Tippett. Patrolman J.D. Tippett was murdered on Friday, November 22, 1963, at 1.18 p.m. in the 400 block of East, 10th and the suspect was said to have been seen fleeing on East, 10th and was arrested in the balcony of the Texas Theater. The suspect's gun, a 38 Special, was recovered and turned over to the Homicide Bureau. This weapon was later identified in greater detail as a 38 Special S and W Victory model revolver bearing serial number V510210. If there ever was a Victory model revolver, I would certainly like to see it. The fact is that some of the old guns in the United States were shipped to England at the start of World War II and were loosely termed Victory guns by United States government propagandists. It is utter nonsense to label Oswald's pistol with the formal appellation Victory Model Revolver as if that were an official assembly line phrase of the manufacturer. The letter V as part of serial number V510210 can be considered an arsenal mark, for it was used solely on guns designated United States property. If the revolver with serial number V510210 was marked United States property it was not revealed in the Warren report. This revolver was said to be a 38 that was rechambered as a 38 Special. 
A cylinder chambered for 38 special bullets can be interchanged with a cylinder as a 38 in some cases, but cylinders chambered for 38 military ammunition cannot be rechambered for 38 special ammo because such a procedure would necessitate the insertion of sleeves which was not done in the case of revolver V510210. It also should be noted that revolver cylinders are marked to identify the cylinder with the rest of the gun and one can assume that the revolver in question retained its original cylinder, but no reference was made to the cylinder number by the Dallas police or the FBI. The pistol bearing the serial number V510210 is of an age indicated by this number which could be expected to have the number 38.767 on the barrel to indicate the correct size ammunition to be used. Also, if the weapon referred to had been shipped to England among the so-called victory guns then it should have also had the NP stamped upon it in one or more places. Quote. It should be noted that the barrel of C-15, V510210, was designed for 38 S and W bullets and, therefore, it is slightly larger in diameter than barrels designed for 38 special bullets. Firing of undersized bullets could cause erratic passage of the bullets down the barrel, resulting in individual microscopic characteristics which are not consistent. End quote. Federal Bureau of Investigation. The microscopic characteristics found on bullets that have been fired were obliterated on the bullets that were said to have been taken from the body of J.D. Tippett, and consequently, they could not be identified as having been fired from the V510210 revolver yet the Warren Commission specifically labeled this weapon as the revolver used in the Tippett killing, Warren Commission Report, Exhibit No. 143. Subset 7 Ferry and Shaw David W. Ferry and Clay L. Shaw were habitués of the old Storyville section of the French Quarter of New Orleans, N.O.L.A. One could say that the entire official assassination investigation is a story of the fairy tale genre. David Ferry, Fari, Fairy, 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 was discharged from Eastern Airlines for homosexual activity and was said to be completely hairless and often resorted to pasting hair over his eyes, eyebrows, and on his head with, appropriately enough, spirit gum. He was also reputed to have been an exotic loser who failed in everything he did and who engaged in various impostures, pretense of skills and knowledge that he did not possess. So, in the mystical charade of the killing of the king, Ferry plays the role of a medicastro, or quack. Shaw was also a homosexual and flagellant and hence, since both men were centered in New Orleans we can begin to understand the influences they were slated to represent in this most publicized of all American murders. New Orleans, Louisiana, is known as Crescent City in reference to the moon and is closely connected to Luna, lunacy, rights, prostitution and every other inversion of the so-called American dream. The CIA station house connected to Oswald, Ferry and Shaw as well as to the formulation of the JFK killing is or was, located in a Masonic temple building, CF. Coincidence or conspiracy, in New Orleans, Louisiana, N-O-L-A. New Orleans will continue to play a major role in the murder, mayhem and perversion of the coming years. It is invariably in the limelight as a supposedly quaint and spooky place and at this writing the public encounters it in a paperback book and film called Pretty Baby about prostitution and a 12-year-old child and in Ishmael Reed's Shrovetide in New Orleans, a motherload of Petro, voodoo, rights which have no end of fascination to foolish people everywhere. Subset 8, Ruby. On December 20, 1947, Jacob Rubenstein changed his name to Jack L. Ruby by decree of the 68th Judicial Court of Dallas, Texas. The etymology of the term ruby runs. French, rubis. Spanish, ruby. Latin, rubinus, carbuncle. In old law books it was once the practice to print some of the titles of the statutes in red and these were termed rubrics or a ruby and hence any fixed, formulated or authoritative injunction of duty was apt to be designated as being a rubric or ruby. As a rubinus or carbuncle ruby pertains to the breastplate of judgment used by the chosen misbit, high priests, of Jewish sorcery, enabling them to receive divine answers regarding the welfare of Judaism, some interpretations claim that the breastplate of judgment manifested the immediate presence of Jehovah and was also worn by masons in royal arch chapters. This breastplate contained twelve stones each symbolizing one of the twelve tribes of Israel. The carbuncle or ruby was connected to the tribe of Judah, Nopch. The term Jack Ruby was once used by pawn brokers to indicate a fake ruby. In iconography a ruby or carbuncle symbolizes blood, suffering and death. Subset 9, Truth or Consequences. District Attorney for New Orleans, James Garrison, was supported by a Truth and Consequences club and is alleged to have been an ex-FBI agent and to have been mentally disturbed at one time. Jim Garrison was an outsider in the secret society machinations of the FBI and may very well have been pharmacologically or hypnotically induced to set up his ill-fated investigation and the position he acquired in the Truth and Consequences Commission. 
Truth or Consequences New Mexico, is a town located on the 33rd degree of parallel latitude, and near the same latitude John Fitzgerald Kennedy became an ablation and on the same latitude is the chief temple on this planet, in the minds of sorcerers, namely the Temple of Solomon at Jerusalem, which was once located there and is sworn to be rebuilt on this 33rd degree. This information is of the first priority and I make that statement not because I have discovered it but because it simply exists in reality in such a way as to forthrightly indicate the extraordinary nature of the processing of this planet which is taking place. This method and process is summed up in the principle of the making manifest of all that is hidden which is to seal finally and for all time the allegedly irresistible force of the eternal pagan psychodrama which works through every mass organization of man. In a literal, alchemical sense, the making manifest of all that is hidden is the accomplishment of the third law of the alchemists and is, as yet, unfulfilled or at least not completed, the other two have been the creation and destruction of primordial matter, the detonation of the first atomic bomb at the Trinity site, at White Sands, New Mexico, on the 33rd degree of parallel, the killing of the king, at the Trinity site, at Dealey Plaza, Dallas, near the 33rd degree of latitude. What remains is for a number of researchers acting through the Freedom of Information Act to make manifest all that is hidden in a way that, according to the enemy, will be irremediably helpful to their cause. This is not a bluff meant to intimidate inquiry, but can only be done with terror of a physical or psychological nature but human curiosity has never been successfully thwarted by threats of a curse to say nothing of frustrating those who seek, on a higher level, justice and truth about the arch-criminals of all history. I do not wish to discourage either of these actions but rather supply you with the final information needed to create an object, if you like, which will serve as the immovable object to block their vaunted irresistible force. This attends the recognition of the desensitizing power revelations have over a hoodwinked populace who sink lower and lower as they discover the extent to which they have been duped and who may, reactively, search for a ruler or drug to put them asleep, to make them less aware. Only the repetition of information presented in conjunction with knowledge of this mechanism of the making manifest of all that is hidden provides the sort of boldness and will which can demonstrate that we are aware of all the enemies, all the opponents, all the tricks and gadgetry and yet we are still not dissuaded, that we work for the truth for the sake of the truth, and let the rest take upon themselves and their children the consequences of their actions.